Uh, it's six o'clock. I'm going to call this meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded by the Ways and Means Committee and GCTV. If any other persons present are doing the same, you must notify the chairperson at this time. In accordance with MGL Chapter 38, Section 20G, no person shall address a meeting of a public body without permission of the chair, and all persons shall, at the request of the chair, be silent. No person shall disrupt the proceedings of a meeting of a public body. If after clear warning from the chair, the person continues to disrupt the proceedings, the chair may order the, persons, the person to withdraw from the meeting, and if the person does not withdraw, the chair may authorize a constable or other officer to remove the person from the meeting. Okay, roll call. Councillor Bottomley. Here. Councillor Forgy. Here. Councillor Golan. Here. Councillor Toronto. I'm here. And Councillor DeSorga is here. All right. So, uh, approval of the minutes. We don't have any public comments. Does anybody um, wish to speak? Okay, I see Doug Selwyn has his hand up. I'm going to give everybody three minutes. And I'm going to just put on my little timer. Go, go ahead, Doug, take it away. Okay, um, Doug Selwyn, Greenfield. Um, I've made a couple of comments about this situation already, so I want to add a couple of different things that I haven't shared. Um, first, to recognize that both the students um, the teachers, administrators, and families are still dealing with the trauma of COVID. And, um, you know, this past year has been somewhat of a recovery year in terms of kids who are used to being back at school, et cetera. But there's still been a lot of loss. There's still been a lot of disruption. And I think it is as crucial as it could ever be that the resources that go to our schools at this point are maximized and not minimized um, because there's still a lot of healing that needs to be done, a lot of learning that needs um, to take place in ways that um, take every every bit of resource that we can gather around us. And the fact that, you know, even the threat of of layoffs, the threat of of programs that are compromised or or reduced or not taking place um, is another set of losses. And when when families take a look at that and say, maybe we want to look elsewhere, that again reduces the amount of money that the, the district has, which which kind of perpetuates a downward cycle. So it seems to me a really crucial time to be investing as much as possible in the kids in the schools, which in turn is investing in the town. And um, what I heard at the meeting last week is that there is money and that how that money is spent is, is a decision that the mayor and the city council need to think through. And, you know, ideally it would be a holistic kind of conversation about who are we in Greenfield? What do we want? What do we value? Um, I hope what we want most is to invest in our kids and their future and our future, and that that means putting as much money as possible into the schools at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Lu Louise, please state your whole name for the record, please. Thank you. Louise Amio, Madison Circle, Greenfield. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't have children or grandchildren in the Greenfield schools anymore. I'm a grandmother, my family lives out of town, but the state of the schools, the condition of the schools reflects strongly on the condition of this town and how we value our children and how we value our future. I would like to second everything that Doug Selwyn just said, and I strongly urge the mayor and the town council to come up with the money because it is critically important for the future of the community and for the future of our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay, yes, please go ahead. Hi, this is 
Just you can just say your name and and just go right ahead and speak. Sit here. You can speak from there, or you can come up if you'd like. I think I've gone up there only so that folks at home yeah. can see and hear you better. My lovely poster, it kind of says my spiel. Um, but my name is Anna McBain, and I live on Deerfield Street here in Greenfield. And I am here to speak uh, about not only the uh, budget as a whole for the schools, but specifically the uh, money that would be allocated to music programming. Uh, when I was entering uh, middle and high school, it was the music program that is what kept me in this town. Otherwise, I would have been homeschooled. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. If Mr. C and the music program had not been here, I would have just not come because because I got my string program from ArtSpace. And uh, the founder and, of ArtSpace and the person that was the uh, driving force behind the founding of SFK actually recently passed away. So it would be really sad if right after her death, we have the legacy that she worked for over 30 years to accomplish, which was a string program in these schools, if we let it die. So I'm just asking, please don't let strings for kids go by the wayside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? Is it public comment right now? Yes. Yes. Julie, yes, go ahead, please, Julie. Yes, um, I just wanted to speak very briefly. Um, Julie Erickson, I live in Waitley. Um, I am a special education teacher at the middle school. Um, and I, again, also just wanted to um, urge you to try to do what you can to close the gap on the budget. Um, obviously, I work with some of the most um, at-risk kids in our school, and I see how much they depend on things like the extracurricular programs to show up at school every day and feel excited and feel ownership. And um, I also have been running the garden club this year with one of my colleagues. Um, and I was sad to see that club funding is something that would be lost. Um, I don't really do it for the money. It's, it's a joy, but we have like, our numbers have just kept growing. We have like 20 some odd kids that participate in the garden club each week at the middle school, along with several other clubs. I see teacher Skrloff is here who runs the math club and um, the other club that you run teacher Skrloff, Dun Dungeons and Dragons. Um, <laughs> So yeah, just um, the enrichment, Spanish, everything, the enrichment is such an important part of our students' lives and I hope we can um, not lose that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. But anybody else? Yes, you may. Yes, come right up, come, come up ahead, yes. So my name is Rose Philoff. Um, I am a teacher at Greenfield Middle School. Um, I live in Greenfield on London Ave. I moved here last May. Um, and I was working in Springfield, I was teaching in Springfield, driving 55 minutes there, 55 minutes back, and an opening happened here, right around the corner from my house. So it's my first year, I am the math club advisor and the Dungeons and Dragons club advisor, and those two things are the highlights of my week. Every single week, after school Tuesdays and Thursdays, I have groups of kids who have no other place to go except there. You know, I have... Believe it or not, 25 kids signed up for math club in middle school because they love that space. The math is one thing, but they love being in that space. And it's, it's those moments where they get to be themselves. They, they're students all day. They're told what to do all day, sit up, stand down, you know, you know, do this, do that. And for an hour, they just get to be themselves. And all of the arts programs that are up on the table right now allow them to be themselves and we they don't really have that for a lot of their school day um and i'm in the same boat as julie i don't do it for the money i do it to you know i i get something out of it too instead of just them um and it would be really sad to lose that and it seems like that's the direction we're going in and that's one of the reasons i love going to my job i also love going to my job because it's around the corner from my house um, and with budget cuts and as a first year teacher, it's really scary to be teaching right now, knowing that that might not stay. Um, and I know I'm not the only one that's in that boat as a new educator in this town. Um, so I know you're doing fantastic work um, and I've heard you all speaking and I thank you so much. Um, 
and just please continue to do everything that you can to support our students. Thank you. Rose, and what was your last name, Amy? Uh, Skrilloff. It's a mouthful. It's S-K-R-I-L-O-F-F. -F. Thank you, Rose. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Oh, well, hold. Yes. All right. Hi, my name is Mark. Do I have to do the whole? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Wahab Minhas. I live on Davis Street, 162 Davis. Um, honestly, I, so I went through the public school system and I was one of um, the last classes. I went to NMH afterwards, but I would, I, I, like it was my sophomore year was when the new high school was being built. And I remember at that time, the planners were showing us how beautiful the building was and everything, but that wasn't the main idea of building the new high school. The idea was that there was gonna be a bunch of extracurricular activities here. There was gonna be a lot of resources for students. There was going to be extra sports activities. Um, and they were also talking about hiring new staff and giving the staff better pay, essentially making it a school and not just a beautiful building. Years down the road, I mean, we're at such an embarrassing point where it's like you have a beautiful building and now even parts of the building are, you know, lack of funding because of lack of funding there. It's like the maintenance isn't enough. But now we're at the position where it's like, cool, you have a nice building, but then what happens inside of it? The teachers are dissatisfied. The students are dissatisfied. There's, I mean, instances of <clears throat> vandalism and whatnot and like you just want to be like oh the kids are just bad well why do the kids feel like there's no sense of community why do the kids feel like they don't have enough resources and stuff to do in the school why do the teachers feel like they're being burnt out like physically they don't have time and two when they have to like beg to be paid fairly and then three when they have to spend their own resources on doing like to get basic supplies for the kids in order to make it a actual functioning learning environment. It's just, I, I don't know what can be done, but I mean, I think it's, as someone who, you know, has a lot of friends who now have kids who are in the elementary school system, who is still in contact with a lot of the teachers. It's just sad to see that we're not investing in the schools, like we're investing in, I mean, cool, we have a nice fire station where we're going to soon and like, we have like a beautiful new library that's going to be built. But like, what about the people inside of those buildings? What about the actual citizens? Like, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to be building all these great, beautiful infrastructure projects, but then not, okay, I won't swear, but like n to not care about the people that are there and the people who live here, like the youth is the future. And you're crying about how like enough people aren't going to the school. And like, that's why we can't get enough funding, but then you're not, you're making it worse. By like defunding them, like what, what, what's going on? So like, it, it just makes no sense. So like there needs to be more effort into putting actual capital and money into the schools. And uh, I don't know if it's, that, if it's too late for that now, or it's now it's just waters under the bridge and we're just like complaining at this point, but like, or if the administration thinks that any of our words mean anything and like they actually need to take some action on that but i don't know it's just honestly it's embarrassing i mean like as an immigrant like we came here and like i have to i sorry if i can have like 30 seconds finish that point just finish that sentence like what my, when i tell my parents like there's teachers who come up to me like after like the meetings i attend and they're like i have to like go buy supplies and they're like what in the united states of america i'm like yeah and they're like, why? We have we spent millions on other infrastructure projects and you don't have money for your teachers. It just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Um, oh, there's one more hand up. J uh, Jamie. Yeah, Jamie, I see. You. Yes, you may go. Go right ahead. Good evening. Thank you, City Hall, um, City Council. My name is Jamie Winnell and I am a former, mostly burnt out GMS teacher. Um, I left the district for a mixture of push and pull reasons. Um, I've been a creative teaching artist on the side and I've, I'm able to do that work now. But honestly, there were some push factors and I know that maybe some of you saw my email recently. Um, and 
my heart is racing even just thinking about it a little bit because I care so much about Greenfield students and my Greenfield colleagues. Um, I'm very grateful that the, the Garden Club continues to go on. And I just, I just want to take a step back that we would look at this time period of you know, moving through the pandemic, there's still many inequities that we found through the pandemic. Our school system hobbled together. It was, it's been a rough three years. I've been at a few different meetings with you all, um, you know, trying to, trying to safeguard things like mental health counselors in the school instead of having police in the school, having more resources for social workers and for special education teachers. Um, every time that there's a, a specials teacher or an elective, that's a time for a regular classroom teacher to have prep time. So those, those specials that you're talking about taking away have myriad ripple effects for students, for staff, everyone in a school. Like every single thing that you're thinking about taking out of the school budget is incredibly valuable. Um, but mostly just taking a step back with the, uh, and this just gets home to me, but the gun violence in this country and in schools particularly, it messes with us as educators, as students, no matter how safe you think a community is, every single school shooting crosses our mind when we have to do lockdowns and thinking about this time in history and thinking about future generations and what are they gonna ask that you do? There was a crisis, there was a climate crisis and a gun crisis, an attack on, on queer lives, an attack on, on so many things that we need and the response of the Greenfield City Council and the response of the mayor was to take money away from schools. I want you to reflect on how that would land if you need to explain this to children in the future. If you need to explain this, play this tape out five years down the road, the schools are crumbling, teachers are leaving in droves, and kids are turning to whatever they're gonna turn to to make ends meet, and they're ending up in juvenile detention. So my question to you is, is that education going to be more valued? Are you gonna fund education in a juvenile detention center over funding schools now. That's my main point. Please take this seriously. Please do everything you can to increase school funding, not decrease it. Thank you. Very much. Okay. All righty. Ask one more time to see if anyone. Was there anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, with that um, introduction, um, I think we're going to start on the school budget. So if you'd like, like to come up, you, I mean, you, it, you might feel better to be up here, plus more people could see and hear you. That would be great. Welcome. questions. I didn't, I can do a spiel, but I didn't prepare one. Well, that is, that's okay. Well, I'll, I will. Actually, can I make a suggestion? I think it would be helpful for everyone if you could talk a little bit about the things that are most concerning for people who are commenting to the city council and to the schools mm -hmm. and what the process is between our discussions of things that would potentially be cut to get to the number sure. and where we're actually at with that. Okay, so the process, first of all, the process that um, we went through, I utilize a collaborative process, despite the fact that it's um, probably you know, more uncomfortable for the administrative team, they have to weigh in on potential changes to the buildings. And I will be honest, I said this to school committee, I will say this to you, the list that was presented are not recommendations. We don't recommend cutting anything, but it would be um, delinquent on my part to not present options for the school committee to have a budget that meets what is eventually voted. So those are potential uh, ways to address that. Um, we look to have we look to have options for budget reductions that are that would still allow us to function. 
um, we did look at schedules to ensure that contractual obligations would be met. So when we talk about elective teachers, we do, there are, that is when teachers get their contractually required preps, but we look to make sure that the draft schedule would still allow for that. Um, so it was a collaborative conversation. Um, and then the list of potentials are presented to school committee. And then certainly, um, I. I believe you all saw I presented in sort of a tiered manner things that are um, more that we could more easily function if those reductions were made. For example, one of the reductions that is for discussion is we had a teacher who put in for their retirement unexpectedly. So that change. Um, voluntary action on behalf of a, of a staff person um, allows us to fund through a grant. And we have a change in the level of staffing. That's for sure. We're going from a teacher full time to potentially a part time grant funded person. But that is a budget reduction that would actually not have um, in, immense impact on the school program. So I want to share that sort of how we look at some of these things. Um, we can make some changes. For example, you'll see a few things that um, there was $100,000 that we had allocated in the ESER grant for textbooks. The district does need science textbooks They're for the high school. That is a subject matter that is tested on MCAS, regardless of your opinion of that. We still have to um, prepare the students eventually. And so aged textbooks are not something that will serve us going forward, but we can take that out of the grant, use the grant funds to pay for potentially salaries for staff that might otherwise need to be reduced. And then I would need to utilize other options for requesting the textbooks, potentially a capital request, because we could certainly argue that textbooks in the Greenfield schools meet the definition of a capital request, given the age of some of our materials. So that is a different avenue if we need. I would certainly rather have staff people than you know, utilize this as the only avenue for textbooks. So you will see some things that are in that um, in the top section of potential ways to address budget reductions. Um, we also have some reductions in transportation from what was budgeted because our transportation coordinator, Jake, is monitoring trends, monitoring current expenses feels that we can at this stage, because you know we create our budget in November, um, and now we have six months more of data to talk about where we could potentially make adjustments. So there are some budget lines in transportation that can be reduced somewhat that will have no effect on our programs because right now our trend is that we can come in a little bit lower in those lines. But for example, if we have an increase in students who um, fall under the McKinney-Vento law, which is for students who are homeless, um, we still have to transport them. It would mean shifting money from a different budget line, but that budget reduction at this point would not impact students. So there are some things that can be addressed. Um, the 100, there's a line 137,000 and change that um, is for curriculum supplies. That is something that we can use out of one of the ESER grants that will be expiring at the end of September. ESER 2 expires September 30th, 2023. So instead of paying for those curriculum materials that will be used next school year out of the local budget, we can use the grant funds. They'll be in then time for use for the school year. Um, that reduces the local budget by 137,000, which is perfectly fine for next year. The challenge comes in when we need to purchase those consumable materials, such as student workbooks or FY25, that automatically increases the FY25 budget by approximately $140,000 because the grant funding source may or may not be available again. But that's something that can be done this year that doesn't affect our students. So you'll see that there are some 
reductions that are um, doable. You will see that there are two staff positions that are potentially being reduced at the high school. We ran the schedule. Students do their course selections, what they'd like to take. They sign up for their preferences, required courses, and then their electives, their first, second, and third choice. And then with guidance and um, the administration, they draft a schedule, run it through the computer system, see what comes out, and then they go through it to look and fine tune. What we found when that first draft schedule got done is that there were some elective courses that we would like to run that had comparatively low enrollments, four students, six students. Um, so when we looked at the potential of needing to make adjustments in the budget, one of the potential ways to do that is to not run those elective courses that had lower enrollments and reduce to staff people. We certainly would prefer to run all of the electives that our students have had available to them. One of the things I will say is that um, none of the required special education courses have been reduced. None of the advanced placement courses have been reduced. So, um, so that's factors I, I want to share with you. So but, let me ask you a leading question, if I may. You may. If the school committee came to you and said, you know what, you don't need a principal at every elementary school. Mm -hmm. We'd prefer you cut an elementary principal instead of these four things. Mm -hmm. And we vote that that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. That would be done instead of this? Yes. Okay. Ultimately, I just want to make sure people are. Yep. So the school committee can say, all right, these are great. But we don't want to do any of them. We, we don't want to do any of them. This is what we want to do. Of yeah. course, we talk about it in public session. We don't secretly talk about it. We talk about it in public session and come to that agreement and we'll do that instead. Of course. So I think it's helpful for people who are listening to the things that are potential cuts to just understand that the process could look and work differently. Absolutely. That ultimately the school committee's decision is final on what's funded and what's not. Since it's your budget at this point, these were options that the administrative team wanted to um, present, especially the things that have, some things have less direct impact on students like those curriculum materials. I know you are our experts on how the schools run, well, not the school committee members. I appreciate that. But we will do it together. Um, we do have some, some things as we go further through the list of potential ways that we could address any budget deficit that become um, much more difficult to contemplate, such as um, middle school athletic program. That is something that we very much think is valuable and want to continue. Um, one of the reasons that was a potential is that the seventh grade students, um, Mike Kuchewski, our athletic director, does waivers to allow our seventh grade students to play up on the JV teams. And at some points, we need them to play up on our JV teams. And um, he was going to do some outreach to the club. I'll say club as a generic term. Clubs out there that run sports, um, I have reached out to Christy more, but through my fault, not hers, we have not been able to connect to see what opportunities the rec department may have. So we're exploring other ways that the students could access athletics, but we very much would prefer to have the middle school athletes be able to compete for Greenfield Middle School, if not the high school. So you will see that they're, that's somewhat of our process. One of the things that did happen when I was building the superintendent's budget. So I work with the administrators, create the superintendent's budget, and it remains mine until school committee votes. So at the school uh, superintendent's level, originally when I did just the math, um, the budget request was actually going to be just over 13%. So I made reductions myself. That included our fourth grade band teacher, which the only reason that was a potential option is because we had a we have a vacancy 
that that teacher is licensed to take. So the person who works for us would have the opportunity to continue to be employed, which is critical for me. Um, we much prefer to have the fourth grade band. It's a very important opportunity for our students and it's a feeder program for our middle school and our high school. So that would be something extremely valuable, but um, I also eliminated some positions that had not been filled, such as um, a second assistant special education director position. It had been posted, it had not been filled. So a position that doesn't displace any current employee is certainly more palatable than displacing someone who's currently working for us. Um, so those were just two of the cuts that I made prior to presenting the superintendent's budget. We also added a million dollars in ESER funding to offset staff salaries. It has not specifically been allocated yet, meaning we haven't said teacher A is funded under the grant, teacher B is funded under the grant. At the end of the day, that's not necessarily the most critical piece, but what I want to illustrate for you that is my greatest concern with the FY24 budget is the grander impact on the potential of our programs going forward, not just next year, but even forward into the future. We potentially, in if, if all of the reductions that I proposed to school committee are in effect, the ones specifically where we would use grant funds to offset reductions and we use the funding we had always intended to be grant funded. We knew there were some positions funded in the ESER grants that as we went into FY25 would need to be added to the local for us to keep those positions. We knew that there are eight positions that are grant funded that will need to be added to the local because we think they are critical positions for the district, but they were newly added with the ESER funds for a total of just over $600,000. The offsets that I spoke to in my potential budget reductions to the school committee was about another $400,000 plus the million that was added into the budget for staff means that just to maintain our current staffing, even after the potential reductions, would mean the FY25 budget automatically has a $2 million increase to keep the staff that we're grant funding for 24. Does that make sense? <laughs> and, that's, and that's even without the $1.5 million reduction, or is that with? It's with. Okay. This is, well, some of it's with. Yeah. The 600000 <clears throat> is irrelevant to that. These folks were grant funded already. Okay. They're going to stay in the budget, still grant funded, because our last ESER grant, ESER 3, does not end until September 30th, 24. So we would have those positions next year with grant funding regardless. <clears throat> but to keep those going further, we would need to add $618,000 into the local budget, assuming there's no other miracle grant that comes down the road, and I'm not expecting that. Um, so a million four hundred thousand was not intended when the grant was originally written to be used to offset staff in the FY24 budget. The more staff that we fund with grant money for next school year puts us further and further up against that funding cliff that everybody talks about. There's analogies that are used, you know, we kick the can where, you know, there's a funding cliff. Well, the can's gonna be over the cliff in 25, no matter what analogy you wanna go with, um, to the tune of almost $2 million. And that does not include any professional development that has been being provided. Um, our staff has been doing extraordinary work with our ELA in math instruction. Um, that professional development is almost exclusively paid for out of grants. It doesn't cover um, a huge chunk of our summer school funding. It doesn't cover um, a lot of technology. Our technology is in dire need. And um, half of the tech money that was originally allocated out of the grant has been taken out of that grant right now while we 
um, verify how to address all of the retroactive payments from our grants, but that you know any remaining would be part of um, technology funding. It does not include um, a portion of our mentor stipends, so new teachers. And going forward next year, any of our new instructional assistants will be assigned mentors. We pay for a lot of those stipends out of grant money. Um, curriculum writing stipends are allocated in the grant. And then our alternative program for students who are not identified as having special needs, our Beacon program, which you might have heard Karen Patnode talk about, has been funded. This is just the ESER grants. These are not our other grants. So all of this, the late bus um, also that has been utilized by our middle school and high school staff is grant funded. So not only do we have almost $2 million in people that would need to be accounted for in FY25, we have all this other stuff on top of it. So that's a good chunk of my concern mm -hmm. that we're, um, we're feeling impact looking at FY24, but I fear that that is not any impact given what we could be looking at in 25. So any additional funding, if we can use less grant funds for people next year, that allows us to be that much further away from the cliff in some places. And I say that much further. I mean, it's still, we still have a lot of grant funds that are being used, but you know, a, any step back away from that funding cliff is going to be of benefit to our students. I just, I don't know how else to make that point, but to add it up and tell you everything that's being grant funded. I told funded. you need a Katie Porter whiteboard. I, 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 yes, a lot of people. So, um, so that's, that is my greatest concern is, is not only what the potential um, difference in the requested budget versus the current proposal for the budget, but cumulatively what that impact looks like for 25 as well. Questions, questions, go ahead, Catherine. So I'll, I'll be my typical self and say, I'm, I'm still working to understand this. Okay. <laughs> and, and we've already had a conversation with I'm still working to understand yes, this, and I, that's I okay. wanted to follow up and I didn't get a chance. Yeah. Can you, so I'm imagining there's this cliff, right? Mm -hmm. Where like we go over it yep. and things get really bad. We can't pay for our teachers. Two plus like, million dollars. Worth right. Two, yes. So we, we can't pay for our teachers. Class sizes are, let's say 30, 40. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Teachers can't do that work. They leave yep. because it's too hard. Mm -hmm. It could quickly, if there's a pending crisis, like it, it could, I don't want to be exaggerated, but I don't, I'm trying to, when you say cliff, that's yep. what I, that's where my mind goes. Mm -hmm. That's one question. Is that like, is that an accurate description of what, well, what could happen ish? I don't know. Yeah, like, what is about like a household budget uh -huh. and you are, have a reduction in your wages because you're working less or something and you're borrowing from your savings to make ends meet in calendar year 23. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do that again in calendar year 24. Eventually, you're not going to have that savings if you're not replenishing it. That's a cliff of its own in, a, in terms of a household budget. Okay. And when we are taking the grant funds and using them for things that would normally be in the operating budget, we're doing the same thing. We don't have that. That is a resource that is finite and it will go away if we're spending it yeah. um, too quickly. So I, I appreciate your um, visualization of the situation because truthfully, I also visualize that cliff. Um, we don't know to your point, and I want to make sure that no one comes away from the meeting saying, oh my goodness, what class size is a 40? I know you were using that as an example. We don't know if there are, you know, there are, um, there are requirements for things that have to be provided. We will always have to provide those. We have to provide um, physical education instruction. We have to provide, you know, core instructional. We have to provide certain courses for our students so that they're eligible for college admission. 
We have to provide special education services, nursing. So there are mandates. So when you look at the pieces of the school program that are not mandated, there are a lot of things that um, theoretically could be impacted that I would say by law may not be mandate, but by student need, by programming, by quality would be um, mandated. So I don't think your visual is all that off. Okay. And so my second part of that is I'm trying to understand the difference if we have $1.5 million or if we, if we don't. Like the, if we don't have this money for the operating budget, our teachers are being paid through grants. Those grants mm -hmm. will end. Mm -hmm. You said they may or may not stay in our conversation. You said these are COVID grants. We're looking They're at COVID, COVID grants. being done as being done, whether or not it is. We're mm -hmm. looking at it that way. And uh, that funding is done. So those those teachers are being funded by grants. That ends. And so next next year, we're lacking 2.5. Well, the, the option for FY25 is that I would be giving you a budget request reflecting adding all of those, theoretically adding all of those staff people into the local budget and just knowing what like I already shared what we, we knew 600,000 of grant money was being used for some staff positions. We already knew that, um, that was planful. The other million point four was not planful. So the goal would be to add all of these people into the local budget for FY25. So already I know that my request to the school committee is gonna be $2 million higher than it would have been otherwise because of this. Um, Keep in mind, you know, this also means using the ESER money for salary means we're not using it for textbooks, we're not using it for technology, we're not using it for things, <laughs> and for things, which is, um, you know, one of the benefits of a non-recurring funding source is that you use it <clears throat> to make improvements to your organization that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. And certainly some of those would be staff. You know, we added, um, nursing position, we added social workers, we added instructional coaches, which are gone now. Um, so we did add positions, but again, that's the 600,000. But there are a lot of areas in the district that need work. I mean, I've mentioned our technology. By June of 2024, almost all of our Chromebooks will be end of life, which means they won't be able to be utilized by our students because they won't be able to be updated and to take the security patches that would be needed. Um, we have smart boards, not, not this TV, um, but we have smart boards on walls in almost every classroom. Some of those are failing. Um, we have teacher desktop computers that are, some of them are from 10 years ago. Um, whoever was on Ways and Means last year, very graciously, um, they approved a technology request for us. So, um, <clears throat> There are other things that aren't getting done that will still need to be done in the district that we'll now have to work with you folks on a different funding source for, so. I see Councilor Forgy has her hand up. And, and Councilor Forgy, I just wanna say this, if you have a question and I don't see your hand out, up, please start talking. The, the last time I missed a couple of people in TV land. Okay, so go ahead. Perfectly please. fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, my first comment is uh, I want to thank Dr. Dubarge, Christine, if I may. You um, please. Uh, because of, of your presentation, I find you highly credible and your arguments are very cogent. Um, my concern is probably having coming from the fact that I did service there and I did work as the assistant town accountant for a very long period of time in Greenfield. Every single budget cycle, it is the same. It is uh, the fact that we have a very difficult task. I'm not saying anything that nobody understands. 
and we have limited resources. And if we put on top of that, the mandates that come through that require us to, by law, require us to uh, provide certain things. In many instances, uh, excuse me, the mandate, especially um, the No Child Left Behind, the MCASs, those types of things do not come with federal or state funding. So oh. I wonder when we're talking about tipping points, it's very valid, but it's also a tipping point situation for all of us, the whole organization, the community we want to be, the types of things we want to provide to our students and our citizens. <clears throat> I, um, I want to work with you uh, to, to get through this budget cycle, but I also want to advocate for um, political pressure being put um, on our different organizations, different funding sources, because there come a time when, as you mentioned, and it's very valid, um, you can't fund everything by a grant, by adding a grant to it. Um, you, you can seek as many grants as you want, but in the long run, where is that going to get you if a grant is a finite piece of, of money? So I just, I, I have to, I, I am compelled to comment that for all the years that I've ever held office or worked for the municipality, the arguments have never really changed. They, they, we understand, we get it and everything else. What has changed is the lack of money, is the lack of resources to do what needs to be done. And I would encourage everyone, please, please, work toward getting and lobbying our legislature, our federal government, um, because especially in Western Massachusetts, we have a different kind of need than we do in the Eastern part of the state. We have different um, students here. We have rural poverty. We have homelessness. Not, I'm not saying they don't have it in the other parts of the state, but we also have a population here that is not wealthy and cannot fund everything. So I'm looking for some equity into the system itself to help fund the schools. Thank you for letting me speak this evening. Um, just sharing my thoughts. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think the... Thank uh, you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's true, <laughs> um, absolutely. And um, I have reached out to advocate for some funding. One of the pieces that is um, immediate that we are trying to very strongly advocate for, and actually I will be attending a meeting with the, um, oh my goodness, now that I have to say his name, I just forgot it. I'll get back to you as soon as that comes to my brain. Um, the, uh, it's from the State Board of Education. His title will come to me. But anyway, um, one, of the, one of the pieces that has affected our district to the tune of almost a half a million dollars is that the um, one of the arms of the state has approved an increase in out-of-district special education funding. Some programs are approved by the state to operate as special education schools. And they're for students who have very high, very specialized needs that we are not able to serve appropriately in the public schools. So it's not like a charter school or um, a parochial school or anything like that. So these schools um, for FY24 received a 14% increase in their tuition. Historically, it's two to 4%. For next year, it's 14, which is almost half a million dollars. So we have been advocating, superintendents, special education directors statewide have been advocating fairly passionately about funding in the governor's budget to allow um, for um, making whole if, um, that amount of money in district budgets because it was a fairly late um, 
decision. It was unexpected at that level. Typically, we budget about a 2%, which has been rolling along. Um, some of the challenges there is, at this point, there's discussion about utilizing the same formula that we use for circuit breaker reimbursement. So circuit breakers, a high cost special education reimbursement program, where once a student's cost for education hits a certain point, districts can do all the paperwork and request from the state reimbursement at a certain percent of anything over that. So it's not the full cost of the full program. And the circuit breaker program has not been fully funded at 100%. We're about, I think they're advocating for about a 74, 78% reimbursement rate next year. And Andy is on the screen. He can yell if I'm totally off. Um, so, but to get reimbursement, the expense has to meet a certain threshold before you can even request reimbursement. And there is some conversation about holding to that type of formula, even for the 14%. So we would still have some um, programs that don't hit the threshold for reimbursement. So there is advocacy for making districts whole for anything over the 2%. So that would have that would have an impact on us, but there is no resolution right now. Certainly if we get notification that that's coming, we can, you know, all of us can make a different decision in some way about what we do and don't do with the budget discussions, but um, that is to be determined. So as soon as I remember the name of the poor man that I'm gonna be talking to next week at some point, I can share that. I'm sorry, it's long, it's long year time. Oh, it's, the new guy. <laughs> it's the new guy. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. his name? yeah I don't no. know. No. I don't remember. No, no. I'll think of it. Yeah. It'll okay. come to me, but to your point, Councillor Forgey, um, we, we are advocating um, in, in some areas, so, but it's, it's an uphill, it's an uphill climb. I also have the fortune of being here solely to advocate for the schools. <laughs> um, you folks have the, the other challenging layer, so I shamelessly advocate for the schools. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Um, at least the way I see it, identifying a larger issue is it seems that we've underfunded the Greenfield Public Schools for a long time, which is part of the reason we're here. Um, and I know we can't change it in one year, but I want to thank you and the school committee for being what I think are responsible stewards of our schools by supporting a reasonable contract for teachers because there are teacher shortages across the country. There are teacher strikes even in our state. Yeah. which would be even more devastating to our schools and our children. So I believe you're being responsible and I think you've laid out with clarity a lot of major issues that these impacts will have. And I think, I guess if we haven't funded it, schools, I don't think appropriately, as we've seen through our statistics that show we're funding in the 30 something percentage of our city budget. And you can play with those numbers however you want, but compared to other cities, it's low. Um, and so it's really about the piece of pie and how it's spread about. And this is really critical. I heard words watching the school committee meeting like devastating, critical. This is pretty big. And I, we, we're gonna at least attempt to make some changes. I, I don't know if we can, we have to work with the mayor. We have reserve funds. I, I don't know what will happen, but I want you to know that I think that you have been very responsible. And I'm here to support and try to help our schools because it's critical for the growth of the city that we start to address this issue and not kick the can again another year. Um, so on that, I was wondering if you could give me some statistics because uh, oh I don't remember <laughs> if you have them on the rough, roughly how much of the, the, the um, contract raise is equal because that seemed, I'd heard it that the, it was roughly 90% of the increase. Yes, was and I'm contract. gonna look up at the screen and have Mr. Paquette confirm my numbers, but my, um, off the top of my head, it's 1.1 million to address the contractual increases. Andy, nod, shake. Correct, it's 1.1 million for the teacher increase. $250,000 for the paraprofessional increase. Uh, custodians were 64,822. Admin assistants were 18,516. 
But overall, it was 91% of 91% of the increase to the of this budget. Break, yeah. 1.4 mil. Yeah. Um, Correct. And then when you add the 400,000, just over that for the special education increase, that's, you know, in a general sense, that's the bulk of the increase that was requested. Um, I have heard language used in other meetings where it, People talk about, well, we have to pay the teachers the contract. Every teacher that will work in the Greenfield schools next year will be paid according to the new contract. That's not yes. a discussion. So I want to make sure that people are um, clear because I've heard language that makes me worry that people think we won't pay them the rate that was just negotiated. That absolutely is not true. Every staff person who will be with us will be paid the newly negotiated rate. So, um, and I appreciated all the work that people on the negotiating committees did, um, especially for the teachers and IAs. It was a very long process, but I thought it was um, collaborative. I was I was pleased with the process. So, um, go ahead. So that being said, kind of follow up to what John was just saying. Um, this um, it's almost as if the entire part that's underfunded, like you said, 91%, right? Um, had that been done two years ago, uh, we would have, it wouldn't have seemed like such a hurt, like such a hit. We would have been able to take smaller chunks out of the, the, the now what seems like this huge debt, you know, or this huge, well, it is a debt. I think it's a debt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do owe it mm -hmm. uh, to the folks that work in the schools um, for sure. Yeah, the, the contractual increase was would have been incremental. Right. So what what happened was um, we had to address FY twenty two, which was the first year without a contract. So then when you have the contractually agreed amount for that, and then you add on top of that, which was a two percent increase, and then you add the three percent increase for this current school year, and then the three percent increase, which was negotiated for last year for next year. Sure. Um, for next year, you're right. Cumulatively, that impact is right. huge in one budget year. Um, if the contract, yes, if the contracts had been in place previous, it would have been a two percent one year, three percent right. the next year. So, yeah, there is. But the retroactive payments that need to be done. So, any staff who was here in FY22, they get the amount, uh, figuratively, they get a check for what right. that was. That is not built into this budget. That is being paid for out of separate funding sources. You folks know the contract stabilization, the Medicaid conversation, and some district funds are being used to take care of that. So the retro is not part of this budget. It's just the cumulative impact. I assumed you knew, but I thought maybe. No, no, I, I, I just, I was. Might not. I guess you reconfirming as a, um, uh, I don't know, as a lesson for the future uh, <laughs> that we should, say, you know, maybe go just that, that little push further to try to get these things done um, in a more timely manner so it doesn't end up being, uh, you know, rather than dropping off of like a, like a five foot jump, you know, now we're, now we're talking cliffs of like, you know, hundreds of feet that are really devastating. Um, and and it, like you said, if 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 it's not handled now, it's just gonna yeah. the, mm -hmm. the pile gets bigger. I just for clarification, the teachers' contract was the one that was um, this year and last year were in arrears. The I, instructional assistance was only this year. Mm -hmm. The um, custodians is done, was done on time. The um, administrative assistance is almost finished and we're beginning cafeteria, um, transportation negotiations, which their contract doesn't expire until June. So the um, teacher's contract was the one that was the most impactful because it was um, the longest duration, but um, we're on a cycle. We were able to come to an agreement, but didn't create a scenario where we had to basically sign those contracts and start negotiating again. Um, we all agreed to um, settle a one-year agreement for FY22 and then a three-year contract. So we've we've given ourselves a little bit of a 
time span before we have to begin again. And I was saying that, I, I just want to point out, I was saying that not for this department, but as a, as a whole, no. with, all, with, a, with any of our, our contracts um, with the city, so that we don't, so that a different department doesn't fall into the same, no, it's you know. Very true. Same, you know, same it's frame. Had a huge cumulative effect. And it, you know, as a person who was on Ways and Means last year, um, seeing like the capital requests and, you know, recognizing uh, the kind of uh, replacement schedule that you were trying to accomplish, um, it's the same way with, with any department with preventive maintenance and, and things of that nature. Um, I'm a big believer in doing that because then you don't get hit with a huge price tag. It's what people should do on their own budgets, probably. And then we should also do that with our municipal budgets um, as well. Is you know it, it kind of it, it it sucks going from you know a year ago uh, thinking a little bit more optimistically about how those types of things. Um, I don't know. That's a close caption. Something new. Yeah. Okay. Um, but now that all of that has has to, you know, take a back seat to to all of these other things that we won't, you know, be able to to replace in the way that, you know, like last year I remember we were talking about uh, I think it was like the the between the capital requests, but like the desktops I think too, like you know we were getting a certain percentage of them this year, and then yes. the idea was like this year we do a few more, and then next year three year plan I think it was. Um, that now that's just like, whoop, time out, back seat. That's not gonna that's not gonna happen. Um, because of the rest of this. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I obviously like anybody else, I wish it were I wish it were a little bit different uh, yeah. in the past to have not not been in this position now. Because I don't see I want to end that thought and then I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> so, so I don't want to just be doom and gloom. Um, but so you were mentioning, you know, anticipated increases for next year, um, a la the 600,000, uh, just in that avenue. Now, my question is if you had to speculate, um, what What would be the driver for the, you know, costs are going to go up every year on everything. Everybody knows that, you know, um, but what would be the more driving forces to why these, these challenges get bigger and bigger? Um, is it, is it, you know, things we, you were discussing earlier, like, um, kind of like some of the legislature that's happened in the last couple decades, um, continuing to drive this cost up is, is it the, the the structure of the mandates that are that are coming through that that are altering the schools? I mean, I'm, I, I hate always sounding like you know, you know, back in the day, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. But I mean, I, I grew up in Greenfield, and I went to the same schools that exist today, except we didn't have the North Parish was an operating uh, elementary school, Green River was an operating elementary school. We had relatively the same size classes as we do now, but an extra building. Um, we didn't have the early learning academy. And so that meant, I mean, I'm just trying to branch this out. Yes, we had bigger enrollment then too, but we had more staff on, in that avenue. And I know that staff has changed and the structure of the schools has changed even in the same exact building uh, and what's, what's utilized and what's needed. So is it I guess my question is, if you, is there something that could be, I don't know, lobbied at the, uh, the educational state level, other than getting rid of MCAS, um, that, that could assist with how, how a smaller area like us um, is able to, to handle those, those mandates and those, those structures? Wow. So that's a good question. It's a big one, yes. um, but there are unfunded mandates. We have unfunded mandates all the time. And I think um, our, I think everybody who's part of this process, education as, as a you know, entity is trying to do what's good for kids. But when, you know, things get 
talked into legislation that maybe folks don't necessarily understand the full impact when you're on the ground in the schools and then we have to put programs and systems in place to address that mandate that costs money and that might not have be, been a foreseen outcome of the change. So there are definitely unfunded mandates. This is a huge topic for educators yeah. across the state, all the unfunded mandates. Um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm happy to find whatever compiled list lives in the administrative educational world, because I know there's one, and Andy probably has pulled it up already while I'm saying these words. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, just, just Circuit Breaker is one example of not being funded at the level that it was going to be. That's a piece because we have to provide special education services for students. Um, so that's that's a piece. Um, the staffing shortage has a huge impact on special education costs. For just one quick example, you know, out of the um, I'm going to say it's out of the pandemic. I don't know if that was the actual um, beginning of this issue or if it was further back, but the staffing shortage that we've been talking about for Greenfield and for other districts that I know of, um, school psychologists, speech pathologists, occupational therapists, um, BCBAs, behavior analysts, huge impacts in those areas. So we had two school psychologists um, who retired at the end of last school year. We were not able to hire school psychologists so this year, we have encumbered $212,000 to try to meet the mandates of getting psychoeducational evaluations done for students who are referred for special education. Um, and that we're still behind. Um, you know, we haven't spent it all yet, but it's based on needs. So we contract based on the numbers of needed evaluations. So even with that amount of money encumbered, which is about $60,000 um, over what salaries would have represented. So that's a piece. We didn't get extra money out of that. And, you know, I think we're off. I'm optimistic about what our state will be for next year in terms of staffing psychology positions. That would be, um, if we keep going the way we are, I think we'll be in a good place for that. But that's, that is an impact. It's a requirement. You know, we get per, we get state funding, they would say that's, you know, funding, that's a funded mandate, but it's not funded when we have to use contracted services because of a staffing shortage. So all these impacts, um, they're cumulative. And, and there's chronic underfunding at, at all the levels, federal, state, local. It's not, it's not easy to target one, um, but you certainly can see at the state level where we have had a recognition is underfunding. So the Student Opportunity Act was introduced, I think, for FY20. Um, and that does supplement some of the funding that comes from the state, regardless of enrollment. Um, and, you know, we also have uh, the, we haven't yet seen what will happen with the fair share amendment. Mm -hmm. Um, but the interesting rub that I'm seeing with the fair share amendment that we talked about earlier today is that Maura Healy, our new governor, is getting criticized for giving tax breaks to very wealthy folks to keep them in their businesses in Massachusetts. Those things are a tug of war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there are, to use the pie example, which I use in my work in financial aid in my real job in colleges. <laughs> so we use the pie example a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but to use the pie example, when you say, oh, we're going to take these money, this money from millionaires and we're going to give it to education and transportation, well, when you dig down, education is, you know, three or four different levels. And uh, higher ed is hoping that they'll get as much as K through 12 does in early childhood. And it's just an, a renewed fight. Um, and it really is about just chronic underfunding. Um, when I came onto the school committee in 2020, uh, we all, as a, as a committee, made a commitment to help uh, bring up our teacher salaries because it has been a very real problem for a long time. Um, and it doesn't happen overnight. 
you cannot just come in and give them a 15% raise in one year. You can't afford it and it's not fair to the rest of the pie. Um, and so those are the things that we're constantly up against. That's why we have smart people on our ways and means. <laughs> um, um, I am concerned with the snowball effect that this might have. Cutting a 1.5 million from the school budget this year. I'm not imagining that that's gonna help in Rowland, which, which I don't think that that will inspire confidence in Greenfield Public Schools as a whole. To, by not funding it, mm -hmm. and I, I, that's one, that's just one of my questions. I think that people won't feel confident that we might have more people will leave because we're talking about cutting things that I've had more emails on this than I have in anything that we've ever had, which I'm delighted about. But um, you're cutting the middle school, the, the IT department, the middle school Spanish teacher, I think, um, the strings for kids, some of the music things, yep. and then it goes on to athletics. Those are things, I, I have grandchildren. It, when they get in the car, all they talk about is the soccer. When they, I mean, for them, it's all about the sports. Yep. If they didn't have that, I don't think, and what happened at, at you know in gym. And, it, and so I think that that's a great loss for those kids if some of those programs are no longer here. I can, they're very heartfelt, inspiring stories for many families. Yes, I agree. I think um, I, there are some things that are on the potential reduction list. Potential, again, to Amy's point earlier, school committee can make whatever decision they feel appropriate. Um, some of the cuts would be, I think, are not as impactful as what you just described. Mm -hmm. I do agree. Our arts programs are extremely important for students. Um, my own, I have one child, one half of his brain is a great artist, the other side is a great scientist, and he's an adult now and enjoyed and benefited from all aspects of his, you know, K-12 schooling. So I think the arts programs, the athletic programs are very important for students to, you know, to take the curriculum materials for one year out of the grant is is less impactful. I want to, you know, when we talk about 1.5 million, that's part of it. So I want to weigh um, the impact of some of our discussion. Certainly, I would not suggest that that piece impacts um, students as much as, say, our fourth grade band teacher, who who would not be um, that position would not be in the district next year currently. So. Um, but I agree. I think students um, are drawn to certain mm -hmm. things, and it would be important to make the district appealing. No, no, well, <clears throat> some students go home extremely excited. I know Rose spoke about the math club, so some students are very excited about math, which is fantastic. Um, but a lot of students are interested in all the extracurriculars and the non-core uh, academic pieces. Thank you. Great. I have a couple more questions. So one is I hear you saying that those cuts would be less impactful and 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 I and I, I don't want to yes, comparatively I speaking. I want to push this a, a little bit. I would say, and I don't know if this is accurate and what you would think, what you'd say about this, but I'm imagining that they're less immediately impactful or less acutely impactful. And that while we won't, like, while textbooks are far less exciting and compelling, that they're equally important. And so I say this for myself, I say this for my fellow counselors, I say this for folks who are residents who are here, I say this for the mayor, I say this for you, for mm -hmm. all of us, that even if we were able to get, I would like, I, I want my goal, I heard you say your job is to advocate for the schools. I believe <laughs> my, my job is also to advocate for the schools. 
I want to be clear that it seems to me incredibly important to advocate for as much as we as much as we can do. Even if like we could pay for strings for kids, that's that's great and that my heart is there. And we need to advocate for the textbooks too. We need to advocate for the entire funding. And I just, I'm not saying that you're not saying that. No, no, I'm, no. Just, I'm saying that um, I think it's a very Big important picture. point to make that it's, I would say it's equally impactful, just less emotionally felt. Um, well, everything, that, everything you decide about a cut has a ripple effect. Exactly. But sometimes those ripple effects um, aren't felt right away. It's right. very obvious when right. there's no fourth grade band. It's immediately obvious that that is the case. If you don't get a new science textbook for three years when you really needed it the first year, the ripple is different. But it's it, different. Yeah. And it's a ripple. And so my point isn't, it isn't, and I hope people here know this to be the case. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do every single thing in our power to keep strength for kids and keep the elective in, electives and keep those, those programs. But I also think that we need to, all of, all of us who are attending today need to be mindful that if, if somehow the money came forward in the next, like, if, if it could come forward quickly, we should still be advocating for this entire amount because those ripple effects will come. Um, Our budget is based on what we need. Yeah, exactly. And that is the simplest way to put it. We ask the, the superintendent to put forward a budget <laughs> that is based on what the schools need to operate, exactly. not want. It, exactly. is, it is need. Yeah, exactly. That's the point I'm trying to make. And so, so a couple of follow-ups with that. One is, I'm curious about the, I have the, the same list, mm -hmm. and I think I do. And I'm wondering if, it's if you're seeing like the the blue. I think that was the That's most bad. devastating. And well, green is that? Am I interpreting yes, that accurately? Yes, the bottom is is yes. Okay, so if more funds were to come, are you seeing that they would like pay for the blue first, and then the green, and then the yellow, or not quite? Or? So it, it, I, I'll take a step, and then you. Oh, okay. So we rely as a school committee on the superintendent, her expertise, and the administration's expertise to make those decisions. And I actually want to quote the mayor from last Wednesday's city council meeting. He said that this is a point in time budget. And since the point in time when this was drafted in its m most current form, um, there have been significant changes. And the same will be true for other departments. And so it's really, I think it's tenuous at best to say that we would just go line by line and do that because there have been things that change. Yeah. And you can no, that's it. That's right. Okay, so I I have questions for the mayor then. Um, uh, is that possible? Would, that, would I be able to ask a question of the mayor? Yes. Yes. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So. At the last city council meeting, there were several votes, right? The, the budget was brought as a point in time. Oh, wait, can I pause, actually? I saw Councillor Forgey's hand up. Oh, oh do you have I don't know if it's been up for a very long time. Well, I've been thinking. <laughs> I would be fine yes, for Councillor Forgey to speak first. Um, oh, that's I'm okay. That, that's good old time. You pass it. Did she, did you um, say you pass it to me? Oh. I couldn't hear what she said. Am I, is it my oh. turn now? Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Gola. Um, I, I actually, oh, well, She's this left. may not work. We'll have to wait till the superintendent comes back, but I'd like oh, to. She'll I, be right back. <laughs> okay. I, I, I would actually like to turn to page 139 in our budget book um, because. Uh, I, I have a few questions and um, it's a cost comparison. It's a comparison by cost center. So my first question has to deal with um, the middle school, the, the 23, the increase, um, which is 78% and the local request at this point. 
I wondered how that is explained, that that 78% increase is explained. What is, what's going on at the middle school? That, that would be my first question. Okay. And then um, the other piece that I picked out on that page, let me just take a look here for a second, is that I see that in 23, there was a cost center for personnel. Um, now there's a decrease of almost a million dollars in that, 743%. Um, so I wondered how or why that can be explained. That's basically my question. So there's okay. some numbers on, numbers on a page and it would be important to have a little background in that. Yeah, I don't know if Andy Paquette can answer can, while we're waiting for the superintendent to come back. If not, we can just wait for her. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Uh, Councilor Forgery, uh, the, uh, let me deal with the easy one first. If you remember in the preliminary comments that Dr. DeBarge was making was that we had allocated a, million, a flat million dollars that we haven't yet distributed as to other funding sources as to what, what we're gonna be using as offsets. We just, for, for capturing purposes, we put that million dollars in the personnel section. That's why you're seeing that 743% decrease from 23 to 24, from the local to local, because we just wanted to capture our use of the ESER funds to offset this budget but we have yet to go through the exercise as to which personnel we're going to be using. So it's, it's really just a placeholder for that. So that's okay, the personnel. So, okay. Um, so before you answer school. question, okay. question number Sorry, two, ahead. then I just, I just have to ask. Um, so when I, I understand what you're saying and it's not unusual, but basically what I wanted to know is, how, um, when you are talking about a placeholder, how does that placeholder um, work, uh, work in regard to the fact that, um, I, I guess my question is more like fund accounting. I guess that's where so, we're at at this so particular point. What's gonna, what ends up having to happen is that because of the fact that in a sense, due to the, the status as to where we stand, there's a potential that we're gonna have to rewrite this grant. We're gonna have to amend the grant. So we just wanted to capture the million dollars. And then we are gonna potentially, once we go through and see where we're gonna use that million dollars in the ESER grant, we're gonna have to get approval for that amendment. So we're in this, I don't say necessarily putting the cart before the horse, we're capturing the fact that we're gonna use a million dollars. Once we determine where within the ESER funding we're going to use it, we then have to amend the grant. And then you, know, you would then see in a sense, and, and I describe it this way as, you know, come July 1, we're going to rebuild this whole budget from scratch, you know, for all intents right. and purposes. And at that time, that's when we'll end up taking that million dollars and saying, okay, we might use some of that for middle school staffing, we might use some of that for special education service. And we'll start to just put those in the rows where they belong. So to follow up, if I may, if, is it okay with everybody if I follow up on this? So what I'm actually saying is that, I'm, I guess I'm asking, when the city builds its budget, it builds it on uh, a, a, a sort of a fund-based piece where everything automatically fits. I'm asking if you're just fill, doing it as a uh, a fund, a, a gen, it's not general fund, it's just a lump sum funding and that you've got X number of dollars and then once that bu budget is voted, you plug in where you need those pieces to go. Yeah, I mean, because to some extent, and now I, you know, as the numbers person, the we need to now look at the educational component of this. And so where the superintendent, the assistant superintendent and the leadership team will then take a look and see based on what it is that, you know, the needs as we know them now, again, borrowing the moment in time approach, uh, where is it then that we will allocate this million dollars that due to the circumstances we find ourselves in, we are, we're choosing to use it when quite honestly, originally that was not part of the plan. 
So in a sense, we that... I mean, we haven't had we haven't had time to necessarily say of this million dollars, we're going to put it here at the middle middle school, here at North Parish, et cetera, et cetera. But we are committed to using this million dollars in some way to offset what it is that we're looking at for what's been appropriated to, to date so far. So is it, uh, we're talking about this particular grant, but let's talk about the budget itself. So once the budget gets vo uh, voted bottom line, then um, if I'm following you correctly, then basically everybody goes back, looks at all the needs, decides where it's appropriate based on the numbers that were given, and then restructure and refund your school department budget. True. Because we're going to, we'll end up learning things. For example, our entitlement grants. We don't know necessarily yet what the FY24 entitlement grants are. We might have additional personnel changes that occur over the summer. We might end up knowing more regarding how this end of the year closes out and do we have more funds available in some of our other special revenue funds. And then once we do, you know, take all those, you know, pieces and then see where things are always under the, uh, the umbrella of what's in the best interest of the students, then in a sense, as I say, rebuild that budget over the summer to get as close to real time need as possible. Okay. Um, okay. So then on the middle school, the piece, middle school, the, in FY 23, we had allocated school choice funds to be used at the middle school. And so FY24, we're shifting where it is that we're using. It's just a, using the school choice funds. We're moving it down to the high school. I, I just set it up here. Uh, so it's just a matter of changing the use. The $300,000 is being allocated towards the high school this year. And the, the only reason why I, I, you know, it's a budgetary practice that I've used in other places where we move because technically school choice funds are to be used for educating the school choice students that come in. So we end up, you know, in my, you know, I'll say my other districts that I work with, we'll pick a school one year that we know we get school choice students in, we'll allocate the school choice students funding there. Then next year we'll, you know, put it at a different school just so that in a sense where, you know, quote unquote spreading and using the school choice funds where it is that we have school choice students. I, and uh, and it, so this is different. I just want to make a comment that this is different than the way the city uh, conducts its business. Um, and I, I'm not saying it's 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 bad or good or anything like that. I'm just saying that it's different because once the council votes the city side of the budget or all the budget, uh, the numbers are in there and that's the allocation. But you get a single amount of money and then you redistribute it. And I'm assuming, and you can correct me, do you redistribute it during the year? For instance, if you um, are, I'm just gonna say over in, you know, say, say the ESSER funds, for instance, if uh, do you hold, would you hold some of those back uh, as a, in a placeholder and use them like uh, halfway through the year, for instance, to fund a need? So not, not, generally, not oh, I'll let Andy take it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, oh. That's okay. The, I say, the ESSER funds and the grants, I'm going to say, are, are not an ideal example in your scenario because we have to write the grants ahead of time for how it is that we're using them. So if we say we're using, you know, I'll use an easy example, like Title I, we've got two, a Title I math teacher, a Title I reading teacher. So we have those individuals specifically identified as to funding out of the Title I grant. It comes more to play in our other special revenue funds, the revolving accounts, in particular school choice, where you know we're picking it as going towards teacher salaries at the high school next year. And so what will come is come end of the year, you know, when we're like, I'm gonna say as we're closing the books, you know, we'll end up providing to the city a journal entry to move three hundred thousand dollars of expenses that were charged to the local budget to the school choice revolving account so that in a sense we're we're using that, that intent it's a budgetary i'll say management tool other places will say okay we're going to pay for these five teachers out of school choice um 
I'll say from my training and uh, and discussions I've had with Jay Sullivan from the Department of Ed, you yeah. know, he's he's kind of said, you know, why in a sense because you could potentially as a year progresses, you know, end up moving expenses back and forth. So he's like, why not, you know, not flood your city finance department with multiple journal entries and maybe just do one big journal entry at the end of the year. That's kind of and like just, our approach is like the, the all funds approach. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the, the city finance department has been great to work with. And if we, we give them journal entries, even during the year, right, regardless of just the normal day to day of operations that ends up happening as far as us needing to move money and they're more than willing to do it, but it's just kind of a, I'll say a budget management style that has worked as far as trying to limit the number of times that we have to do the movement of funds. That's why if, you, if you've ever seen me report out to the school committee, you know, there are times when we might run a budget report. And when you look at the Munis report, it'll show a deficit in the general fund budget projected of, you know, 200 some odd thousand dollars. But then I'll always report about the fact that we still have the 600,000 or whatever in school choice. And we have all these things that come end of the year, we'll end up doing that journal entry to zero out the local budget and move those expenses to the school choice where the intent was originally. And this is, this is, forgive this question, I should know the answer to it, but when we, when you go ahead and you do those journal entries, does it take, does it have to go through the school committee or does it just go straight out to the city? No, not the school committee. If the superintendent approves it, we, you know, we, okay. we, and then we provide to the city council. The school committee's policy is on budget transfers. And, you know, we, we work with the budget finance subcommittee and talk about the budget transfers, but there is no tra uh, school committee policy regarding expense transfer from fund to fund. Thank you so much. That's been very, very helpful. Thank you. Councillor Forgey, I, I would add from the school committee uh, side, we have a, a bi-weekly warrant that is approved uh, that all, all of the school committee can look at and those journal entries do appear in it when they're there. When there's a journal entry, we can see it and we are signing also, off, at least one of us are, is signing off on that. Thank you, Chair, that's also correct as well. Thank you very much. Sometimes I know things. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, do you have one more question? I do. Yes. Um, and actually, this, this might be a couple of questions. I want to verify my numbers first um, with Finance Dir Director Schindler. Um, Diana, if you're there, I just want to make sure that I'm using the right numbers before I ask the question of the mayor. Are you there? Screen. Okay, I see her there. So if you're there, my first question is, I just want to... Verify. My understanding is that we have $388,521 in free cash. Is that accurate? I believe that is the correct number, yes. Okay. And I believe that we have $100,000 in contract stabilization. Is that accurate? Uh, thereabouts, yes. Thank you. Okay, and how much do we have in capital stabilization currently? Um, I haven't actually calculated since the, the votes the other night. So no, I wouldn't be giving you uh, an accurate account considering um, you know, the, the votes that were just taken. So I, I, don't, I can't give you that number if that's what you're looking for. Okay, my understanding of the, it's like over so this is, you have the um, it, sir. Well, it was 2.3 million. And I think we took out approximately 700,000 that okay. were before out of capital stabilization last week. Okay. So in near $2 million, we have quite a bit of money in contract and capital, excuse me, stabilization. Um, Correct. That, that okay. Thank you. So first, I want to say I wholeheartedly agree with what's been said about the chronic underfunding of schools on the state level, on the federal level, and this is definitely not just a local issue, and that we, we all really do need to be advocating for change on the state level. And looking at the numbers, I'm seeing money for the schools, 
And so the question is to the mayor, we have $388,000 about, and the fiscal year is almost over. And we have $100,000 in contract stabilization. And council voted, voted down wayfinding and the library roof last time. And we have near upwards of, I don't know, 200, 2 million, maybe 1.5 million to be conservative. And also, if we look at the school budget and what's, what's, it looks like it's what's, what's going to be cut. If I'm just doing simple math and I don't understand all of the line items, but it looks like 436,000 of that would be appropriate for capital requests. And I'm wondering if you would bring us order. I know I really appreciated at the beginning of the last meeting, you said you were looking at looking for guidance from us. Um, and, and I think I perceived some like, sincerity in that and was appreciating that. I'm wondering if you would bring us orders to use that money to put toward the schools, to use the free cash to put towards the schools, to use the contract stabilization to put toward the schools, and, uh, and the money that we voted down uh, that I think is better used than wayfinding in the library roof to go with that toward the schools and to give a capital stabilization request to the schools. This is a long wish list, but it, this is money that we actually have. And so the question is just honestly, if you would, if you would bring us motions so that we could fund the schools with that money. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I'm assuming I'm allowed to speak now, Councillor Forgey. I mean, I'm sorry, Councillor Disorder. Uh, uh, the, um, thank you for the question. Um, well, I appreciate that you have found what you think are some funding sources. Um, I do have a meeting with um, Super, uh, Superintendent DeBarge, uh, Finance Director Chandler, and um, Andy Paquette, our business manager, on Wednesday to discuss how we might be able to resolve some of this. Believe me, it will not be all of it. So just know that we are in conversations about that. But at the end of the day, it is Free cash and stabilization accounts are one-time funding sources. Your um, stabilization accounts come from free cash. So while it's true that you can um, utilize um, stabilization funds or free cash for any lawful municipal purpose, one-time revenue uh, should only fund one-time expenses. So what I'm trying to say to you is um, it is not good policy to use all of your stabilization accounts to fund an operating budget. And the problem with that is basically you create a funding cliff for the next year. That money doesn't go away. What happens with that money is it's added to the uh, two and a half percent increase plus new growth. So that would mean we would have less money to fund the next fiscal year with. So you have to um, take into consideration that there are many other needs within the city. We have uh, mandatory retirement funding. We have um, annual health insurance increases. We have a lot of things that have to go towards the whole city. And that includes our teachers and our school staff. So um, I don't know that defunding or that's a really bad word and I, I'll take that back. Mm -hmm. um, reducing our stabilization funds to uh, offset an operating budget is a, is a good idea at all. 
uh, I am willing to discuss with um, the school uh, superintendent and the business manager, the um, places where we could possibly use some of the stabilization money going forward, but it is not um, going to uh, realize what I think you want to realize. It is just not good policy going forward. If we um, utilize all of our stabilization funds for the school this year, that has very, very, very significant um, impacts on our borrowing for the next year. A drop in the city's reserves uh, will impact the bonding next year for the fire station and the library. I, I go back to my statement from the city council meeting, which is all of these departments are important. And it is the responsibility not only of me, but of the city council to ensure that we are equitably um, funding not only our departments, but the ability to maintain our borrowing for some important projects that we have already committed to. So um, if you're going to um, cut the departments uh, in order to increase the staff, you have to figure out where you're gonna do that from. Uh, but I do not support um, 100% uh, uh, using our stabilization funds toward the school budget. We will come up with a agreeable, I think, uh, request for you going forward, but um, some of the suggestions that you've put forward are basically irresponsible. And, um, and I cannot support that on behalf of the whole city, which is the hat that I wear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Go first. I have some follow-up. Okay. All right. So, um, so I would say as a as a follow-up to that, uh, Mayor, as um, just going by some of the numbers that were already put out there on money that was to be spent. So it seems like we didn't. I wouldn't call that irresponsible. Um, if we were already going to put it towards something else, and that got voted down as not a priority. Um, so I, as some finite numbers, I wouldn't, I, I agree with you that we shouldn't be drawing all of our stabilizations down and there are repercussions to that as well. But I would say that we have, um, my suggestion at least, uh, coming with some quick numbers is we voted down $357,000, $357,180 in capital requests that if we were already going to spend that money on those, then it doesn't seem like that needs to sit there in a savings account. Um, waiting for something else. Um, I would, because I would also suggest that out of that, um, uh, I guess 85,000 of that would, would cover, you know, the Legion parking lot, the police roof, which I think we all agreed on for the most part need to be done, um, but could be taken out of stabilization capital funds rather than free cash. Um, and I don't, that doesn't seem like a big hit to something that has $2 million in it. Um, otherwise, I guess just don't do those. Um, the other is uh, just, just in, the, in the savings itself and then the free cash, you say it's like a one-time payment. I don't, the way we get free cash as it's been explained to me is almost like when people are sitting waiting for their tax return to come back because they were overtaxed the entire year and didn't know it and they utilize it as kind of a savings account. And, you know, I don't think we should be setting our budget, so to speak. It doesn't sound smart to me, at least, to set a budget that's, I mean, this one just seemed like, well, if it didn't get spent, I think it's a lot of a way that a lot of the state funding works is, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it kind of thing. So if we're putting out requests and hoping that we're going to get it back because money didn't get spent, I don't think that's a real good way to go about um, setting our budgets either. Uh, I know you don't want to be at a deficit, but we did have a, a lot of free cash this last year. Um, but even just some of these things combined together are, are very 
and not even maybe draining the whole entire free cash. Before that, it, it, just with the just with the differences that we voted on last Wednesday between what was presented to us and what came out of it, there's four hundred thirty-seven thousand one hundred eighty dollars immediately available that was to be used on things that we voted against. So that's not reappropriating that and being like, hey, you know what? If, if, the, if the folks of the city think that the schools are a higher priority than some of these other things, there's $437,000 that was going to be spent on other things anyway. That seems kind of like a really easy um, flick of the wrist for a, for a financial order to at least offset some of that that were not, that were short on the schools. It's not, it's, it doesn't take care of all of it, but I think that's a very easy, I mean, it's almost a third. And if we, like I said, if we were going to spend it anyway on, you know, trails and um, uh, a, a roof or a building that should probably be sold for a dollar, um, and 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 a, and a vehicle which I know is is needed, I, I actually was more for that um, than the others. But uh, if it was already going to be money that that was okay with being spent. And then the, the, whether it's folks on the city council or the, the, the entire community wanting to more rally behind, you know, funding our school and education, I don't see how that part is irresponsible. I can, I can see where you, you would use that term on, on possibly some of, you know, like I agree with you on draining everything. Um, but I think it's irresponsible at this point not to do that because it was already money that was ready to be signed away for other things. Councilor De Silva. Yes. yes. Um, may, may I speak? Yes. Thank you. Um, respectfully, I think we've moved away from the purpose of our meeting which is to have people do the presentations of their budgets at this point mm -hmm. we will be doing deliberation which is exactly what we're doing now there's a lot of department heads that thank are you. waiting. thank you council yes i agree i just i think that we don't usually do, there were questions that people asked of the mayor she won't be participating in the deliberation part so i think I allowed those questions, but thank you very much. Did you have one more comment? May I read it? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, she does have. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Forgey. I agree with you. Uh, this is not the time or the place, and we have. Uh, well, once upon a time, earlier in the meeting, we had other department heads who were here to speak. Thank you. Thank about you. their budgets. So, um, uh, Councillor Terunzo, I I'm not sure where all your numbers are coming from. What I have is a uh, in the neighborhood of 167,000. Um, I didn't it's free cash. tally it up it's free cash. Uh, from yeah. free cash. Uh, that would be something that might be um, up for. Um, discussion with the school department. So um, as I said, we have a meeting on Wednesday with the school department, and we will talk about what the uh, ability of the city is to do and maintain funding for the rest of our departments and the importance of doing that. Um, so that is, um, that is my, thought for now, just cre understand that um, you cannot deplete your stabilization accounts or your free cash um, just for one-time funding sources. Um, or they are for one-time funding sources. You cannot use them for your operating budget. And, Thank um, you, Vic. Thank you, Mayor. Just one, you. one last question. Keep it this side. That, that, that big, because we, we have to move along. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just want to say I have no interest in depleting the capital stabilization fund. I agree that that would be irresponsible. 
and I am looking, I echo everything Councillor Tronzo said, and looking at the requests that will not be funded, almost 500,000 of it seems like it would be appropriate request for capital, a capital expenditure. And if it had come through the capital budget, I would have voted for that. Those are, if capital is supposed to be things that last five to three to five years, I think a great deal of this budget, which would not deplete capital stabilization could be paid for through those funds. So I would hope that you would, and I'm saying this now, and I'll be quiet after this. I'm saying this now because you're meeting on Wednesday. I would advocate for those funds being used for the school budget for capital. It seems very appropriate to me. Okay, thank you. Um, on that, I'm gonna move on, okay? I am gonna move on. And I just wanna point out before we do go on that there was, um, 6.2 million, 6 point, 6 million dollars in our stabilization accounts and that we are asking the schools to deplete their one-time funds to pay for operating costs. So it's a little mix of both, but onward. Let's go on to the next thing, which is the text rule, okay? The Franklin County Technical School. So, is he here? Rick, Rick, Ma Rick Martin? Yes, Rick, I am. Hi, here. how are you tonight? Good, thank you. And thank you for your patience as I'm running between two meetings. I just finished up at the DFL meeting. Um, so, I'm glad I am able to join you tonight. Um, if I could just have a few minutes, could I give you a brief overview of the budget book that Absolutely. you have? Absolutely. Okay, could I share my screen? Yeah. Yes, you may. Do we have to? That would be, oh, Kathy, this is, this is a god wink. I'll check out of that part. Huh? Okay. <laughs> okay, how do I do this? It's coming, Rick. We have an expert here. Maybe. Fernando's on still for me to ask him something. Uh, also? Oh, no. Wrong button. Okay. You should be good, Superintendent Martin. Okay, thank you very much. And so I'm just gonna, I mean, if you can hear, I, my voice might come in and out um, because of the, probably the cell phone service here. Um, so I'm just gonna show you how we receive our money and then how we use it. Then I'll take any questions and I will show where we are from a Greenfield student perspective and where we are with enrollment trends. So the assessment to the towns, you can see our five-year trend right here. And that goes up at about 3% per year. And our per pupil chart, which I'm gonna show you now, um, it will show Greenfield. Right here, you have 117 students. You have a uh, per pupil rate of 10,000 at the far right-hand column, 10,088, which is a few thousand dollars below our average of 12,129. As far as assessment trends are concerned, if we look at Greenfield over the last four years, you can see we, you, you were at 100, 123, 122, back to 117. So your assessment's gonna be lower because you have five less students um, than the previous year. As far as a uh, trend, what that trend actually looks like from a chart perspective, when I look down here, I see en enrollment trends right here. Mm -hmm. And we are probably projecting um, pretty much about the same as based on the number of graduates that we have with the incoming freshmen that we are projecting. So we don't have the FY, um, we don't have October 2023 count because that hasn't occurred yet, but we'll have more firm numbers in about a month or two. Um, what that number would look like for the FY23. So when you're navigating through this budget book, you just have to go back to the top left-hand column and you click sources of funding and it will take you right back to the main or you can click um, 
uh, you can you can then click the table of contents. The debt service is what we have here is our windows and doors project that we had from eight years ago. And Greenfield's assessment for that is right here. That's based on the equalized valuation. So that's about $47,000. That number has gone down a little bit from the previous year. That number will fluctuate a few hundred dollars here or there, but it won't fluctuate that drastically over the next seven remaining years. Um, we have chapter 78 in DOR cherry sheet. You can see our age gone up just a little bit there. So um, we look at chapter 78. Whenever you click on something in blue, it will give you a brief description of chapter 78. And then how we actually get that, it will take your rate. If you click down here, it will take your rate to the state website and it will tell you more about that as well. Um, but as far as the chapter 78, as it relates uh, to our cherry sheet, as you if you look at the number 5957 in our regional transportation at 739, I go to the cherry sheet and it will take me right there. So when you're looking at my budget book, you're going to be able to just click around and you should be able to find everything pretty easily. Um, if you wanted to look up any other towns and their cherry sheets, you just go down here to the bottom. Um, it, it can clearly take you to that. And then as we move to state aid transportation, um, where I just explained that one. So non-member towns are the students that are from uh, towns that don't pay into the membership and their cost is substantially higher. You know, for instance, if Greenfield's 10,000, most of our non-member towns are in the $24,000 range. So um, tuition from our pre-employment program would be zero because we only have a few students in there this year. Other revenues, are your Medicaid and your excess and deficiencies um, help offset the, the, the next year's budget. Um, we expect that number to continue to be in the same range for next year um, based on the recent numbers that have come in from the state when they provided, um, you know, 90 or, or I think now 100% regional transportation reimbursement, and they only gave us a cherry sheet of 739. So we expect that to go up about 200,000, which will fall into our E&D the following year. The use is how we use our funding. So here's where the rubber meets the road. District leadership administration, most of our, um, our uses of funding are due to enrollment increases. So as you can see, we went from 796 to 847, but we did add a dean of students. Um, our athletic director was a PE teacher and athletic director. He is now our athletic director and our dean of students. So that accounts for that adjustment there. Our instructional services have gone up the largest, and that is due to increased staffing. Now, when you're in this budget book looking at this and you can't fall asleep at night, you can simply go to instructional services and click that on, and it will take you to all the places where we increased our, our salaries. Let me give you an example. If I go down to um, our welding, I click on welding, it takes you right to the line item of the budget, and it will show you we go from 167 to 234. Well, we had to add a third instructor um, because of OSHA regulations. We had too many students in the electric in the welding shop to support our students, so we needed to add an instructor. That's usually gonna, you'll find that to be the case. So if you click back to welding salaries, it will take you right back to the main narrative. If I go back to sources of funding, we are now back at um, our conversation piece here. So the biggest driver is enrollment increases, which will then allow us to add more staff in that regard. Uh, student services has ticked up a little bit based on individual needs. Um, pupil transportation, we were just talking about that reimbursement. So here we are with very minimal we, we have a little increase in our, our pupil transportation overall cost, but we're only getting reimbursed a percentage of that. So we're not getting the whole thing back. Plan operation and maintenance, that's gone up largely because of a few things. Um, one is the 
you know, when we got into COVID, we needed to wipe down and disinfect every single knob and button on every single machine in the building, which required an additional staff member. We're still keeping that into practice. Plus, we have a new outbuilding. It's a new veterinary science um, clinic building that is up and will be ready for the fall of 2023. So we have that facility going up and to maintain an aging facility. Retirement contributions, insurances, and non-employees insurances are pretty flat line from all the other years. You're not going to see anything drastic in that area. Here's where you're going to see the biggest drastic part of the spending right here. Rental lease equipment and capital stabilization. So what ended up happening is we were at a 15-year power performance contract for HVAC and rooftop, new, uh, rooftop units, new boilers, and um, that lease we knew was coming to a close. So when that came to a close in FY23, we were um, fortunate enough, we, um, we applied for many years, but we are into the eligibility process and uh, we'll most likely move into the feasibility process of a new core, a new core building. So we have to go out to a feasibility study. So we were um, taking the rental lease equipment 517 and thrown it into our capital stabilization of 250 and that gave us 750,000 and the reason for that is we had two choices one is to go out to bond to all our member towns for about 1.5 million for a feasibility study or try to fund it through this particular mechanism within our operating budget and save our towns the burden of a long-term debt so that's the direction we um, decided to go. And then the debt services and school choice tuition. So there's the bottom of 15 million and that's the top of 15 million. And that's the uses and sources of funding. The budget book's like 50 pages long where you can click wherever you wanna go. Um, and uh, it should be online very soon if it's not already online today um, regarding um, our budget. So that's my, quick budget presentation. I'll keep the book open in case anyone has any questions for any place that they need me to go. I'd like to thank you for offering some things to do if you couldn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There'll be some nice places to look. And um, also, I, I, I was happy that we were participating in another borrowing. That was very good. Thank you so much. Does anybody have questions? You always do a very lively presentation. Thank you. Well, thank it's you. Nice. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, Council, oh, oh, Council Ford, did you have a question? I can't see your hand if you do. You can, you can speak, you can just speak out. You can speak out if you have a question. So yeah, our culinary arts and um, uh, welding and veterinary, are those your three biggest? No, actually, um, it is probably the welding, the electrical. Yeah. Welding, um, okay. And the veterinary science is right there as well. We are, we did receive a competitive grant for more than um, total $5 million to build a um, new aviation program. That's probably going to end up being our most popular the kids will walk out of there with an AMT or an aviation mechanic technician's license and have the other option for avionics line maintenance or, L or ALM. Both of those jobs start in excess of 50,000. So we're excited about um, the possibility of having that. That, that hangar and um, the airplanes have already been purchased and um, we're looking to construct the hangar right off the end we share an 8,000 foot property line with the Turner's Falls Airport. So we'll be 20 feet over our line for a aviation um, hangar and new aviation program, which will take day and evening students for certification. So we're really excited about that opportunity moving forward. Um, and, I, and I know that will draw a lot of interest. Any more questions for Martin? Yes. No. no questions. Nobody else? 
All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. So next we have, I think we have um, yeah. uh, Ms. Mark Snow. Yes, <laughs> Hi, Mark. How are you? Fine, thank you. And yourself? Good. Good. So if you find the page, yell it out. Okay. <laughs> right. Page 124. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you know what? You're like, go to the head of the class. Found it. After you've just been out of school. So there you go. Okay. All right. 124. I see what you did there. Okay. <laughs> so Mark, go ahead. Tell us about your budget okay. and what's new. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tonight, uh, do have three budgets related to the inspections department to present mm -hmm. to the committee. Uh, okay. The first one is the building inspections. The second one will be weights and measures, which is a contract through the Commonwealth in uh, uh, City of Greenfield. And then the third is the contract between the FERCOG inspection program and the City of Greenfield. Like I said, the first first budget is the building inspections. Uh, the proposed budget is $233,766. That's a 5.9% uh, increase, which equals uh, just over $5,300 increase. Uh, the increase is in the wage line uh, to meet the contractual agreement. All the other expense line items are level funded with 0% increase in each item. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward budget. Uh, that's pretty much it for my presentation for, for that budget. Uh, would you like me to continue on to this? I, I just want to ask, so you have three full-time employees <laughs> and one part-time is the part-time person in inspection? Yes, so we do have uh, three full-time employees, uh, be the building commissioner, my position, uh, local inspector, and then uh, the DEC coordinator, which is office staff. Those are the three full-time positions. We do have a uh, part-time inspector, local inspector. Uh, that individual uh, works 22 and a half hours per week. And what what does what does his job? Uh, he is focused on vacant and foreclosing properties, and he is starting in on the periodic inspections as well as the other uh, full time local inspector. Okay. All right. Any more? Any questions on that? Weights. You, and you have weights and measures which increased dramatically this year, but that was that was a charge, correct? Per, yes. Um, yep. Yes, uh, the city of Greenfield uh, contracts with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for weights and measures device inspections uh, for a long period of time. It has been a standard fee. Uh, mm -hmm until this past or this current year. Uh, back uh, earlier this budget year, uh, we did receive a new contract uh, from the Commonwealth, which had a significant increase uh, that was totally unanticipated and unforeseen uh, from the city standpoint. Yeah, we had a financial order for that sometime during the year. Okay. Yes. Anything else on that? And FERCOG inspection? FERCOG, <coughs> FERCOG inspections. Uh, the city of Greenfield contracts with the county uh, for electrical, plumbing, and gas inspections. Um, that uh, budget has a slightly over 3% increase. Uh, it was uh, 98,367 this current year, and it's going to increase to $101,400. And 
and again, that's a contract between the city and the county. Are people pulling a lot of permits, Mark? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we are. We are. Uh, we're very busy. Uh, people are doing uh, a lot of projects, uh, and plus, there's a fair amount of number of projects uh, being discussed and in uh, plan planning stages right now. So, <laughs> which is great for the city. Very good. That's what we like to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else for Mark? No. Okay. Next, we have Kath, uh, the city clerk. And I think I may have found that. How about 93? Is that 93? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Kathy. How are you? Thank you for fixing that. No problem. Um, so I don't really have a presentation prepared. It's fine. Other, uh, you know, I can certainly go through what is in the book. Um, the city council budget, uh, the increase is by contractual obligations for the administrative assistant salary. All of the other line items are the same or slightly lower. So I reduced the office supplies because the council advertising budget had to increase because the advertising budget for public hearings is always over budget. So I would rather make up the office supplies in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, it's just finagling. And that's really all I have to say about the city council budget. Um, the clerk's budget starts on page 93, actually 94. Um, again, the clerk's budget, the real difference is in the salaries and contractual obligations for the assistant clerk for the administrative assistant by contract. Um, my salary did in this budget get a 3% increase. Um, so that's where the contractual obligation and salary increases lie. Other than that, they're um, Again, office supplies I brought down because the meetings and seminars needed to go up and so just a little bit more finagling there. Um, the registrar's budget is exactly the same as it was last year, no change at all. Mm -hmm. The elections budget, however, is different and this is the budget that fluctuates year to year, depending on how many elections we have. In fiscal year 24, believe it or not, folks, and I am not happy to be thinking about this, there is a presidential primary in March. Um, and then in the following year will be the state election and again, the presidential election. So this is a little inaccurate, but for a person to vote, Prior to 2020, they would go to the voting place, they would pull a ballot, they would cast a ballot, and they would be done. That's what we did for work for them. Right. Now, if they want to vote by mail, this is what we do for them. Right. Every single step of the way. So this is a very nice, I know you can't on TV land see it, but instead of having three steps to vote, there are now 12. So the work on the office for elections has gone up astronomically. You were talking earlier about the school, about unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I looked, your last one, or like the presidential, uh, the, in 20, it was like your budget was around 50,000. Do you think it might even be more than that? Just, I mean, yeah. it was around well, because 50,000 because it, that's, that was... Yes. So again, when we set up, we have DPW come in and set up. Mm -hmm. um, we have staff that go and set up. Salaries have increased, so we have to budget for that increase. Um, we do pay our poll workers. We pay them minimum wage. Not unlike a lot of, a lot of other communities. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we also have to have, by law, we have to have at least one police officer at the polling place for a certain amount of time 
so you know everything everything has gone up everybody's said it throughout the throughout the departments that you've spoken to everything's gone up mm -hmm. we're of no exception um mm -hmm. that's that's really it i had a question um speaking of unfunded mandates uh thank you you're welcome so now that we're um <clears throat> two districts in our city two legislative districts. yeah legislative yeah. districts has that i assume that there's gonna be higher costs with that um or is it just more of a headache and did when they did that did they um did they decide to compensate uh the city in any type of way to make so up for that the compensation question no, no. Okay. um I don't believe it's going to cost us more because the split districts only come in when you're talking the legislative districts. Mm -hmm. um, and those are on a state election. Okay. So it will show in September of 24, I'm probably gonna get my years mixed up. It's gonna show in September of 24 but those ballots are printed and paid for by the state. We don't pay for that. I believe there's a slight increase to the programming data that we have to pay our, who we contract with, ES and S, um, because there's a little bit more work that they need to do, but not a lot. Um, it's really more just a pain in the tuckus. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we were able to, when, so when we, we did redistricting, the council took a vote to redistrict the precincts. Mm -hmm. And then the state legislature used the old map mm -hmm. to split mm -hmm. the community. So the council had to go back and re-vote the, re, the re-precincting they had already done. Um, because if we hadn't been able to do that, we would have not had not have only had split district first and second Franklin, we would have had four precincts that would have been an A precinct and a B precinct. Mm -hmm. So we would have needed to purchase four more voting machines. I would have need to have needed to have four more workers per precinct. So 16 more workers. Um, but the state was very helpful and was able to get us back down to just our happy nine precincts. Okay. I'll just say that my only question in all of your pieces was what that $15,000 increase was for under elections and you yeah. totally answered it. Yeah. And thank you <laughs> for the work that you're doing there. That's okay. <laughs> Anything else for Kathy? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, have a good night, folks. All right. And um, is Hope McCary still on? Hope, hi, Hope. Thank you for waiting. Actually, thank you to everybody for waiting. I know this is a long night. Thank you very much. It's long, very long. I appreciate it. Okay, go ahead. Hope, tell thank us. You. Tell us Hope. Thank you. Tell us Hope 163. My name is Hope McCary, and I'm the director of the Greenfield Council on Aging. And I do want to thank specifically the Ways and Means Committee because I know this is my 17th budget meeting with Ways and Means, and I know how hard it is every year, every year. It's never easy. Um, but I'm here to talk about the Greenfield Senior Center and the Council on Aging. Uh, but I want you to understand that I know the larger picture in the city and you have difficult decisions to make. Um, the Greenfield Senior Center, uh, we are on page 163 and 164 of your budget book. Uh, if you have a book in front of you, we have four employees. Of those four employees, 2.2 full-time equivalents are covered by the city. Um, the total is 3.2, including grants. So we heavily rely on grants. Uh, it's not ideal, but it works for us. 
uh, for now. Uh, there are approximately 400, uh, I'm sorry, 4,000, it's a little past my bedtime, excuse me, 4,000 seniors in Greenfield. We serve about half of those. We don't serve everybody. Uh, we do our best, but with two full-time staff, you know, we have our limitations. Um, but I'm really proud of, of our department because we do provide a space for seniors. And, um, you know, there are a lot of studies that show that when you're aging, you need these strong connections in the community to family, to friends, um, you're happier, you're healthier. So everything that we do is with the lens of social connection. And so I could talk to you about the data and I'm happy to answer questions about that. But, uh, you know, our seniors, they're your retired teachers, your retired Greenfield Tap and Die, employees, uh, your retired DPW, and everybody else. So it's through the lifespan. Uh, and, and we're there at the other end, you know, there's the education piece, you go through your work, and then you retire. That retirement might mean you're still working and you're still struggling to make ends meet. And that's where we come in. So we're helping you apply for Medicare. We're helping you figure out your health insurance. We're helping you figure out your taxes. You can't make ends meet. Maybe we're distributing a food distribution, all of those things. But at, at the very, very heart of it is the personal connections. And what we, I'm not going to share them because they're so personal, but we will get thank you notes from widows who say, thank you for being there because it helped reduce the trauma that I experienced. So the Greenfield Senior Center, sure, we're playing canasta, we're playing mahjong, um, you know, we're offering fitness classes, but the heart of it is the socialization. And I know you have a lot of other departments to get through. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, we're very proud to serve the community with the resources that we have. And no matter what you do with our budget, we're going to continue to serve the city of Greenfield because that's what we do. Thank you, Hope. I can say from going, it definitely is about the connections. Um, and you do a lot of great work there. And I think it's a blossoming population. And the gathering of people is very, very important. Thank you for, for everything, for all you do. Now, does anybody have any questions for Hope? Thank you. Yes, no, okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Nothing else on that then. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you. All right. Next up, we're going to have Carol Collins from the Energy Department. 110. Page 110. You know, this is page 110 in our homework books. Okay. All right, Carol, take it away. Tell All us right. what you'd like to about your budget. A few hours ago, I would have given you like the whole song and dance. Right now, I'm going to be short and sweet. So, I, but I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you for the opportunity. I did uh, hope you received a handout that kind of addressed what I saw as some of the questions at the last Ways and Means meeting. I didn't get to watch it until Friday afternoon. So, mm -hmm. but I addressed questions that I've already heard explain some of the assumptions that I made, and then also listed out all of the contract related services, which for me are not that huge. And um, I guess I'll just make one kind of blanket statement. As you all know, I cover all the utility accounts for the city and constantly I'm looking to save money and make our energy cleaner. And uh, those two things 
happen in sync with each other. So we've been making some great strides and I'll just share one positive number that uh, for any of you that, as you know, pay your electric bills, the, the Eversource rates went up quite a bit this winter and we were able to offer through Greenfield Light and Power a rate that was less than half. And before January, we had already saved in total all Greenfield customers that have been with Greenfield Light and Power have saved over $1.6 million. So I'm just uh, very happy that we're able to provide services like that to the community in addition to the work that, uh, and I say we, it's me, we is me right now, but um, <laughs> for the city. And I'm happy, as I said, to take any questions. Thank you. Questions for Carol. Yes, I, I have I have a question. Right ahead. Could. Right ahead. Um, hi, Carol. I just want to, I just want to know um, in your permanent wage and salary line item, I want to know the requested um, and then the mayor's recommendation. What is the difference there? It's roughly twenty five hundred dollars, a little less than that. And um, it actually uh, was something that I worked with the mayor to get in parity with colleagues of mine that do the same type of work, sustainability directors in other cities. Um, and so that, that reflects my request. And then um, at, at the current time, well, I, I believe it was an error that it was cut back to what it is in the in the FY25. And I've since uh, spoken with the mayor and the finance director that um, we hope to be able to increase that as, as more monies become available in my budget. Is that, your sa is that a salary decrease for you? Not from what I make now. Okay, thank you. Did you, question. did you receive the same 3% increase as the other department had? Are you? The 3% increase is what the mayor's approved line item is. I had requested, as I said, I, to be in parity with, yeah. I didn't, also the other question is, I didn't know I had a solar farm. You have a solar farm. It's already saved yeah. the city over two and a half million dollars, and it covers a half of the electricity use in for the municipality. That all saves us money every year. Thank you. Um, now I have a question. Do you think that the old library is actually going to cost fifteen thousand for the electricity, or maybe a little less? Okay. I. When, when I did this in January, early January, when we did the budget, uh, my understanding was that the existing library, the Levy Hubbard House, I, I got it wrong. Um, you know what I mean, though. Yes. Uh, that, that would remain as offices, potential offices for city staff. So I budgeted it at using what the current use is to come up with an amount for an occupied office 45 hours a week approximately. Now that it's up for potential sale, that may wind up not needing to be budgeted at all. Okay. Yeah, I wondered about that. Okay. Any other questions on that? Um, a lot of them are down, including the propane at the at the the propane at the temporary fire station. That's down, and a, a horrible you, first and year. Your, <laughs> the contracted services are down. Yes, they're actually the same. It's just that we oh. had to cover an additional year last year for one of our contracts. That okay. didn't, Any more questions for Carol? We feel like we should ask you more questions because you've waited so long to get to speak to us. I feel like I should ask you more things. Oh, 
Well, go right ahead. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much, then. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have uh, Jennifer Hoffman with the health department. That would be page 161. Good evening, counselors, and thank you for having me here tonight. I did have a long spiel like everyone else, but I'll be quick and uh, get to the point. So um, as everyone here knows, the health department has municipal obligations, such as inspections of all varied types and places. Um, and then we have nursing, which does our public health initiatives and programs, which we have grown exponentially um, this past year. Um, we do have a lot of grant funding that it, we are heavily grant funded in the health department. Um, and that helps pay for most of my part-time staff. I have um, four part-time employees, all grant funded. And, um, and in grant dollars, I have almost $500,000 in grants. Um, as for my budget, um, it's basically uh, the same. I, I was uh, a little bit down in salary for a position, um, and um, I did go up in legal fees. That is because with um, COVID and housing, a lot of the courts were closed, and I know that a lot of things are going to be moving forward to court. And I know that legal usually makes us run over. So I asked for more money um, to help with that. Um, but basically everything else is there, but I, I do have to emphasize for our small and mighty department, um, I have a great department who cares very much about the city and really doing good for the city. And, um, and I'm just really proud of, of the people I work with. Any questions? I, I do, if, if I could. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back over permanent salary and wages because the request is uh, different from uh, the mayor's recommended. Yeah. Um, can you explain that? So um, when I first was going to want an extra inspector, uh, but the need came up that I the health department could use a clerk more than another inspector because um, the paperwork is pretty immense um, to keep up with. Um, and that was removed. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So did you get the funding for the additional clerk and not the additional inspector? I'd rather have not had the inspector so I could have a clerk. Okay. So the current needs, I was, I mean, clearly I am working hard to figure out where to find money for the schools. And, um, and this was one thing that surprised, surprised me um, that in, given the pandemic that there was the request for the additional inspector, but that, that it looks like that hadn't been funded. But you're, do you feel like, Director Hoffman, your needs are, the city's needs are currently met, that the, the, the additional need was being met by the clerk that you have and not um, getting this additional inspector? I don't have a clerk. Um, you don't have a clerk. I do not have a clerk. I was, um, I have a Currently, right now in my office, I have a full-time inspector. I have a vacant inspector, which I'm hoping to fill very soon, and a part-time nurse and myself. I was, I rather have had a clerk, a, you know, a clerk instead of two more inspectors because I have a vacant right. and I would have hired. Okay, and so then the discrepancy between your requested budget and the mayor's budget would have paid for that clerk? Yes. Now, you had two revolving accounts also, mm -hmm. um, 1563 and 157, no, 1562 and 1563. The health department, 
health department permit fees mm -hmm. and um, that closes to the general fund. Um, do you know what the balances are in either one of those? No. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't have that available. Are, I can get they, that for you. No, 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 that's okay. I, I, um, is that a lot of your paperwork? Does that account for a lot of the paperwork that the um, the permit permit expenses? Oh, absolutely. Permits are um, especially in the beginning of the year are a lot of work and a lot of time, mm -hmm. um, where we have to balance, you know, what we can do for inspections in order to catch up with permits. Mm -hmm. Any more, any more questions on that? Not really a question. I'm just noticing that that closes to the general fund and right. the, the expenditure of the department. So is that very busy for you and there's something like the county fair or what is? So for like uh, the county fair, we are now asking people to send in permits on time um, so we have a deadline for whenever a food truck needs a permit or whatever the case may be, so we can process the paperwork. And then on the day of uh, the inspection or whatever festival, we would hand the permit so they could function. Um, but the paper has to be, you know, it's not just a piece of paper and a check. We have to make sure all their paperwork is complete and um, all their forms that we request are complete. So it's not just issuing Here's your permit and phone time and so on and so forth because usually paperwork is missing. So, anything else on that? Okay, I think you're off the hook. I can't Thank think of you. anything else. But Thank you for all you do for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. So next up is um, IT. That would be Fernando, and that's thirty two. Hello, everyone. Thank Hi there. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having me over and I wanted to say thank you to the council and the mayor for the monumental task of doing this every year. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I would not want to be in your shoes. It's definitely a tough, tough job. Um, so I won't go into a lot of detail. I'll leave it up to you to ask me any questions that you have. But as you are aware, uh, my department, uh, we basically support everyone. Uh, all the municipal departments, as well as some systems with for the school system, uh, school school department. Um, I have a hardworking team, um, and as you can see from our goals, I'm also very very proud of what we accomplished last year. We did a lot of work, especially for the new library and library, um, mm -hmm. and now we have a fire station that we're going to be doing a lot of work for, which will also save a lot of money for the city. With that, I'll leave it up to you to ask me any questions that you might have. So it says you have three full-time employees, but I, I thought, do you have, currently do you have two? Right now I have two. I have a new, uh, uh, we had a retirement back in December. Uh, we have a new hire coming online on next month on the 8th. So um, are you gonna have, is that what you're gonna have is a total of three? Uh, I have three right now, and I requested an additional. So you, the, the change in um, the budget is an additional IT, uh, entry-level IT professional. So that would be four then? That would be four, right. Okay, so it would be, you, you'd go from three to four. Right. And you, and you just said you have a new, a new hire that's coming, that would be your number three? That okay. would be the number three. Yeah, we okay. usually have three. Yeah, we have three budgeted for this year. One, re he retired in December. He's being replaced on uh, next month. 
Okay. And your on call stipends, I said that's up, and we have been calling on on calling you a lot, Fernando. <laughs> I think. Uh, we were very glad, I have to say this from a personal perspective, that you were around for those evening meetings when the um, GC, uh, GCTV or and ours and whatever were not interfacing. I think that's the word, interfacing with each other. They didn't know each other. And we were very glad that you were there. Yeah, well, that was a, that was a labor of love, actually, because the stipends <laughs> actually are for public safety, you know, to be honest. Oh, really? Yes, for those oh. meetings, yeah, but that's what they're there for, for emergencies, you know, dispatch goes down, all of that, oh. you know, so, oh. but it's okay. <laughs> well, thank you for coming then, I didn't even know that, I thought, <laughs> I said, I actually thought the stipend should be increased so you could come more, but well, they, now they, I know I'm, that I'm that actually that. was for, uh, <laughs> that was for dispatch, for helping other departments, not us, so thank you for just coming, that was very nice of you. My pleasure. All right. Do we have more questions on this? I still can't find my charger, Fernando. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that, so yeah. I'll have to increase the budget a little bit on the. Um, <laughs> right. No, just kidding. Um, no, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, uh, overall the, the budget for my department uh, went down, including adding the new person. Uh, we. Um, streamline some of our monitoring systems and ticketing systems that allow us to save some money there. Um, well, we also had a reduction on our on our um, hardware costs, which I don't really like to do because then you get to that cliff when you still have to replace those systems. You know, it's like ongoing maintenance, but uh, um, we should be able to handle a year, you know, push some of those. So that's how I feel about the budget. So I have to ask, like every other day, we get something on cyber security, and I yes. figured I, I'm not going to sign up for that because I wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> but, um, um, you're not uh, getting those from me, but no, no, are. no, no. I mean, it's 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 not coming from you. But I saw that you wrote something in your in your budget about that, I believe. So, do you feel like we're all set as a city on cyber security? I lose sleep every night. Well, not every night, but um, I mean, part of the responsibility of the IT team is to, you know, uh, keep the flow of information going between every department, but as well as protecting a lot of the, you know, valuable information that we have for mm -hmm. all our employees uh, and citizens. So um, we have some mandated, not really mandated, but uh, for example, we are required to um, do multi-factor authentication, which um, you don't see it reflected on the, the software cost because we were able to lower other parts uh, of the budget. But, uh, you know, I agree with what, that we have to do those security uh, aspects of technology because um, next time you're in City Hall, I can show you the number of attacks that we have every day, every week of people trying to get into our network. Um, so, you know, that's why we build systems that are robust, I believe, on, on layer defense systems um, from our end user firewalls, antivirus. Um, yeah, for me, that's interesting. For you guys, it's probably boring. So I won't go deep into that. But they're right. important. Right. And any more questions that anyone has? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on so late. Okay. Next up, we have Thank you. Ellen Boyer. Um, Ellen, it, I think this is like this is like the last budget season, isn't it? Huh? It is. For all yeah. those years of service. Huh? So. <laughs> you miss that, huh? <laughs> Um, All right. <laughs> you ready for me to go? Yes, go right ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so the library's budget is on pages 170 and 171. Mm -hmm. um, like other people have mentioned, we have contractual increases um, in our salary lines. All of the library staff 
is paid by the city. I have no grant funded positions. Um, and the largest increase will be for a new library director. <clears throat> when I um, announced to the mayor that I was not going to renew my contract at the end of June, we took a look at other municipalities in central and western Massachusetts who had a population similar to Greenfield, a library similar to the new library, which similar in size, square footage to the new library we're building, communities that had um, invested in their library, either built new or remodeled in the last 20 years, libraries that had the same number of full-time equivalent employees, <clears throat> and the same number of um, annual items checked in and out over the counter at the library. Then we took a look at the director's salaries and um, we decided to average those and put that in as the salary for the new director. It is a significant increase um, over what I make, um, but the job will be quite a big job moving into the new library, moving into a building that's two stories, just about twice the number of square feet with basically the same number of staff members. <clears throat> I also have in here, it is not a new position. It's, uh, it was in our budget last year, someone left. It's a part-time position, 20 hours a week. And instead of having that be on the adult services desk, I'm hoping to transfer that part-time position to the kids services department. This year I was able to move um, a part-time person in the children's services department to full-time due to a retirement of a long-term employee. And now um, I'm hoping to have two and a half people in the children's department it's half of the square footage of the first floor of the library um, and we'll need more staff than we currently have. Let's see here. <clears throat> Again, um, the other thing that I increased was the book budget by $5,000 and all of that will go to um, buying books for the children's department. Much bigger space. I prefer not to, to open with completely empty shelves in the kids department. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, so what, what was your salary this year and what are we offering the new director? My salary was 72,000 and we have the new director in at 82. And that is lower than the average of the nine communities we surveyed. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. And so the $55,000 increase in permanent full-time salaries, that's, that includes that. And you said a part-time children's librarian is okay. in the, I'm just trying to get understand where that $55,000, how that adds up. Okay. You are looking at permanent full-time salaries. Is that what you were mm -hmm. asking me? Yeah. Counselor? Okay. So I have 11 full-time employees. They are all members of the city's clerical union. Um, I, we put them in at a 3% raise. I don't think that contract has been settled yet, but that's put them in at a 3% raise. Um, and then there was the significant increase in the director's salary. There's a slight decrease in the part-time line because I had a part-time person who had been with us for three years retire and we're bringing the new part-time person in at um, a slightly lower rate of pay. Same, same um, what do they call that? It's late, I'm tired. <laughs> um, 
It's the same classification in the union schedule, but a lower step. So just to make sure I'm understanding that accurately, that $55,000 is that increase of 10,000 plus the contractual increases for the existing employees. That is correct. There are no additional employees. The employee count remains the same. That was my mandate um, about eight years ago. Build the new library, but staff, build it twice the size of what it is, but staff it with the number of people that we have. So a lot of the design decisions that went into the library were um, with that in mind. We have much clearer sight lines than we have in the existing Levitt Hovey House, which is a house. Um, if you stand in the plaza, you can't come inside yet, but if you stand in the plaza out front, you can see straight through the building. Um, so there's really wonderful sight lines. <clears throat> and we increased staff workstations that are available to the public, pulling some staff people out of um, their offices more and putting them in front of the public just to have additional staff oversight everywhere. So I have a question about the um, su supplies and books. Um, so every year we get money from the state for like, I don't know, I think it's like about 50,000. Not quite. <laughs> Much. It's been between 30 and 40. And how is 11 years that I've been here. And how is that reflected in your budget? So up until this budget request, we spent that money on <clears throat> electronic resources. Okay. Um, that money was spent completely on there, on those. That's for you guys, that's downloadable stuff, streaming stuff, eBooks, audio, yep. e-audios, Canopy Hoopla. Those services during COVID, it was really one of the only ways at the beginning of COVID that we could get materials to people. I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of COVID, we had we weren't clear how the virus spread. Mm -hmm. So libraries were not allowed, the state disallowed us um, from circulating physical materials. Mm -hmm. um, and then, <laughs> We were allowed to circulate them if we had quarantined them for seven days and then disinfected the book covers. Mm -hmm. So um, people turned to us, they started using our digital services, which mm -hmm. you all have access to if you have a library card. 24-7, mm -hmm. uh, 365 actually. Yes. Um, <clears throat> People who said to me, I will never use a downloadable service. I will never stream a movie. Right. When you have no choice, you do things you say. <laughs> so the rest of my state aid next year will be put towards um, funding the gap between the $10,000 in electronic resources I am asking the city to fund and what we actually spend. Okay. There's just one other thing I wanted to tell you. Somebody mentioned revolving funds. Yes, I, I like can't it. remember. Yeah. Um, so we do have, the library does have a revolving fund. Yes. It's called mm -hmm. library fines. I'm not sure that all of you are aware, but it, um, it has become the trend in, public libraries to discontinue overdue fines. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of data and studies that um, indicated that that was disproportionately um, disad disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. It was disproportionately affecting people who couldn't afford to pay the fines. Mm -hmm. So we have a $20,000 amount in that line. We will not make that. We still charge people when they never return library materials or when they return them damaged. 
it's it's our responsibility to take care of the materials that belong to the library because they actually belong to the city. Um, but we're not charging overdue fines and we are finding that um, materials are being returned with more regularity than they were when we were charging fines. A that's little bit good. late maybe, but we get them back. Well, that's wonderful. I had read that. That's very good though. Great. Um, was there anything else? Oh, the mayor, mayor, did you want to speak to this? Do you have something? I do, I do. I just wanted to say, and I will lower my hand. Uh, I'm also almost out of battery, but I just plugged it in. So I think I'm good here. Um, the, the clerical contract has been settled and it will come to you um, in the May meeting. Uh, so that's just a little piece of information that Ellen may not have. <laughs> I, I just thought, I just I just signed it today, so um, it'll be coming to you uh, for the May meeting. Thank you. I Thank would you like to. Hello, I would yes. like to um, just yes. say. Thank you, Ellen, for your service to Greenfield. Wish you a very happy retirement. Happy days ahead. Thank yes. you very much, Councillor Forgey. <laughs> Echo that. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Anything else? Okay. All right. Um, moving, thank you so much. Moving right along, we have Christy Moore um, in recreation. Last one. You know. Oh, thank you. Oh, I love it. I don't know. Uh, if it's um, yeah, I'm on one seventy three. And she has a she has revolving to on sixty seven. Okay. So um, yeah, I have two. If you want to start with revolving, I have two revolving accounts, and that's how I operate. Um, as you look at my budget, I pretty much only have humans, um, which is three and a half and an extra half that we're getting for FY24. Um, yes. Just about every youth event, adult sporting event, uh, special event, the parks, um, I'm in charge of the pool. Last week I spent a week with some staff cleaning. Today I went down there, thanks to all the rain that we had yesterday, I had about two inches of, of water in the building again. Um, so that's kind of stuff that, that we do. Um, the parks, like the playgrounds, we have wood chips coming this week. Um, dog park, 4th of July, triathlon, what's in mayhem, you name it, energy park, we pretty much do it. Um, with three and a half um, people, it's um, incredible. If you look at my time card, it's never 37 and a half hours. We work incredible amount of um, time and effort to put on uh, all the events that you see in that brochure and the programs. So back to the revolving. That's how we buy basketballs. That's how we buy pencils. That's how we buy paper, ink, anything to operate our budget comes out of revolving. Um, that's the 1900. We also have the 1910, which is a child care. We run child care for the city in the schools with the schools. Um, and that is the 1910. So that's how I pay for those two revolving accounts all my summer seasonal, which is between 50 and 70 youth um, and some adults that we hire. And all the after school staff is paid out of the 1910. Um, I think that's pretty much it with revolving. Unless you guys have oh, no. questions about revolving. Out, out, out of 19. 90, who's paid? 1900 is. I know. Yeah, 1900 is um, summer seasonals. The only thing that's paid out of 1910 is childcare. That's separate. So, lifeguards, gate, camp, concessions, special events, sports, everything that's not childcare comes out of there, Jenny. Okay. And what is the balance in that? Do you know? Um, well, the fiscal year starts July 1, but it's really weird for us because we are not 
um, on the same kind of calendar that way. So like camp registration, all the summer stuff is coming in now. So my revenue is just really just starting to come in. So last time I got a report from accounting, it was like 10 or $12,000 um, in my revolving 1900. I can't remember what was in 1910, but okay. So then it bumps up because people are paying for their summer childcare, basically summer camp. Um, any other questions with 19 under? No. So that's um, purchase of services, um, any contracts, and salaries comes out of 1900. And or 1910 if it's child care. Um, my FY24 budget is on 174. Um, again, it's the most simplest budget you'll probably see tonight. It's just people <laughs> with one change this year. So we have um, three and a half people uh, currently, um, but for next year, it's um, we've added a half so we can have four. Um, the added half is finally, um, we're gonna be able to open and hire the teen center um, to get that going. We work closely with the schools um, for a number of superintendents actually, um, but now with Christine, um, we're ready to move forward with that. Um, the, Program supervisor was just hired about um, six and a half months ago. So that's why we weren't able to hire um, the teen center person because I needed to onboard and, and train that person. Because um, my previous program supervisor left right in the start of spring, summer chaos. There was no time to think about hiring and onboarding a new employee. Um, so that's what the um, total wage 230, 215 is. Um, the longevity increase is because my assistant director, who is fabulous, Kelly Jenkins, uh, she has now reached the um, longevity pay. Um, so that's why the longevity is myself and her. We've both been there. Actually, she's been there longer than me. Um, I'm starting my 16th year. Um, she worked as a counselor. And so she was there as a summer camp counselor before I got there. Um, and then Shaylee Demers is our program supervisor. who's doing fabulous. And then the teen center position, I just got word from HR that we have applications. So we're gonna start to interview hopefully um, in the next week or so to get that person on board. I have enough money at the end of this fiscal year to get them onboarded full-time um, so that again, we can start training and preparing for the summer because of registration and all that kind of stuff for the fall and after school starts pretty much in July and, um, for fall school, after school care and teen center enrollment. And then new this year is our purchase of services. So that is the um, water testing. Uh, the DPW and the health department um, are um, basically we're, we're state mandated to do water testing for the river. And um, the DPW was able to cover that in the past out of um, special water account, but that is no longer um, able to do that with the state. And so that's why um, this is in here. This will include the weekly testing for the swim area, as well as, I hate to even mention it, but we have to do the special testing based on um, last year's closure with yeah. uh, um, the um, cryptosporidium and uh, uh, gerardia that we had. So we have to do the special testing um, in two weeks so that we can clear to be open for the summer down there. Um, so obviously that I'm gonna have to pay that first one out of um, my operating, I'm sorry, my 1900 revolving. <laughs> Um, but then going forward, all the weekly testing and any special testing, knock on wood, I won't have to do that after this first one um, will come out of there. So for a total of 237, 115. Okay. So that sounds good. I have just one, I have one question on back on the revolving. Is this, that those salaries at $165,000, the three of them, that's what it takes to run the, but mostly to run the, the, um, yeah, can you tell me what number that, what page that was on? 71. On um, the revolving. Did you say 71? 71. Um, yeah, that is. Um, there. The first three lines temporary salary. Yep, so that's. Time and part time. Yep. That, the, that totals 165000 Is that what it takes to run the. To run what? That's the pool. That's all my. Um, 
hires for the summer outside of childcare. So that's pool, okay. lifeguards, yes. okay. anybody who um, leads a sports program, yep. um, gate, concessions. Got it. I just wanted to. Yeah, that's the, like 50 to 70 different people that we Perfect. hire. Perfect. I just wanted to be clear. Yeah. Yep. And then again, down here, the 125 and the 1910, that's all my childcare staff. The site coordinators, the group leaders, the assistant group leaders um, to run um, our licensed child care. We have regulations that we have to follow through the EEC. And actually, we were just relicensed um, in April. It is April, in March. Okay. Yes. And have your numbers in child care stayed the same? Or they continue to grow. As a matter of fact, today we just had another call for a family. Okay. So we run child care at Four Corners at Federal, and the Newton kids get bus to Federal Street. Yep. Yep. Okay. So nobody's left out. Other than AEL and Teen Center, <laughs> they keep paying. <Okay. laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. And um, skate park, obviously, um, that's moving forward. All the like we write grants like we we wrote and received the four hundred thousand dollars for the park grant we wrote and received the sixteen thousand dollar grant for the dog park improvements we get um, um mass cultural festival grants we do art projects like we do so much um with three and a half four people and we are very lucky to have you <laughs> yeah thank i want to you. thank you for being thank on you. this yeah. list of accomplishments is yeah. pretty stunning and the, the special events really define our town so thank you thank, thank you, you. That. that's it all right all right thank you for waiting <laughs> a long night for all thank you very much okay so next up we have retirement is there anyone here for retirement no? Okay. All right. And how about I think veteran services come right up. I have to say hi. Save the, the, the last, the, the best for last. Huh? Hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, hello, the know my name is Chris Myers. I uh, took over a few months ago for Tim when you retired. Okay. okay. So we have four people in our department uh, myself. We have another turnover to replace me, a new deputy director. And we have a veteran service officer and our administrative assistant. So we just don't cover Greenfield. We cover 26 towns yes. in our district. We have the largest veteran district in Massachusetts. So we cover all the way to Plainfield and Hawley, all the way out to New Salem. Uh -huh. So uh, sometimes we're on the road quite a bit. So because of that, some of our costs are shared costs by the other towns. Mm -hmm. So our biggest cost you'll see is one of our biggest costs is our salary. Um, and that is covered 44% by the other 25 towns. And Greenfield covers down on 56% of that. Mm -hmm. And our next biggest cost you'll see are all the benefits. Those are mandated benefits that we have to pay out called Chapter 115. And they're all assumptive we kind of figure out how much we think we're going to pay out every year it's different every year the state of massachusetts changes the laws every year on it mm -hmm. so you see the big change from last last year to this year um, under the miscellaneous uh, from 16,000 to 20 to the 26 mm -hmm. I forgot my glasses um, the biggest reason for that is they changed the cap on how of who we pay back their medicare of our chapter 115 applicants so that, because of inflation went up so high over the last year, that cap went up higher, which means we're paying, we're reimbursing more of our clients, uh, their 164 90 a month for the Medicare. So it's pretty much double what we're paying out. Um, so that, that's our, our biggest changes. Um, our uh, Chapter 115 benefits, all the, the vet benefit money, um, it, we're trying to project how many think we're going to come in each year? We are going to die on us, and unfortunately, that's how it goes. Um, we've been able to bring this down year after year after year um, because of the work we're doing to bring in other benefits to those Chapter 115 personnel. So um, this will probably be the most accurate year um, this year and next year when it comes to Chapter 115. The year, years prior, we were kind of high, um, and now we're going to be teeter tottering right on that. We're going to make it or we're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. That's, 
much the big stuff that we have. Do you know all of us? Do you, Chris, do you know everybody here? I do not, no. Okay, so I was just thinking about this. this <laughs> you came to, to something else for capital, and yes. I thought, okay, so yeah, capital this is um, ca these yeah, are right. Catherine, okay. Catherine Golub, oh, my, Mike right. Bonzo, Jonathan Bodley, Ginny DeSorga, and, and I'm sure you Chris probably do. Yeah, okay. just so you, and I know you know yep. the mayor and everything. I just thought you were coming before us, and I was like, we don't have little name tags in front of us. That's all right. That's all right. Are. So, um, so there are four full-time employees, is yeah. that right? How is the space where you are for that? It's good. Um, it, it, it works out well. Uh, our biggest issue really isn't space for us to work. It's we have every 8214 on file for every veteran in all those 26 towns. To say that again. Somebody all their, all their um, to mute out there. I don't know if that would be. And all their military discharges. So we have to keep copies of those, and anything that we do for them, we keep copies of. So we have a lot of filing cabinets in our in our area. Okay. So that down the road, I'm gonna have to look at buying some more because even though we have veterans that pass away from all the other wars, we have more veterans that are getting out every day out of the service, and we're getting their paperwork and. We got to save it so when they come in for benefits, we can help them. Now, now you get an allotment too from the state annually. Is that reflected anywhere here so, in the budget? So what happens is the state gives us enough. So the chapter 115, all the veterans benefit money mm -hmm. will be refunded 75 cents to the dollar next year. Right. So first quarter of next year of this year, you won't get the money until first quarter of next year. So every dollar we pay out, Town pays out for veterans benefits. We'll get seventy-five cents back for every dollar a year after. Yes. Wait, am I understanding that yep. accurately? So, if we spend five hundred and thirty thousand dollars this year, we're getting seventy-five percent back. No. So that's the only that's these right here. The, the line these. items that say vet benefits. Okay. Those are the ones that are reimbursed seventy-five cents to the dollar. Okay. So all of these we pay whatever this yep. total amount is. And we get 75% back. Correct. And where is that accounted for? I have no idea. It comes to the town and Kelly sends me a thing and I verify that the okay. that's the right amount of money that's, that comes back. To make sure the state doesn't make mistakes. Uh -huh. it comes in on the cherry sheet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it comes, cherry sheet. In, yeah. it comes in on the cherry sheet. Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. That's where it comes in. Um, I do have a question, if I may. Uh, aside from the 151, um, which is mandated and everything else. Can you talk a little bit about the coordination that you offer to veterans that are seeking different types of service, for instance, referrals to uh, say mental health organizations, the VA, um, no. volunteer veterans groups, things of that nature? Sure, yeah, depending on what their council for you, whatever they come in for, um, most of the stuff we can send them to the VA but there's a lot of stuff that we'll send them out to um, some family counseling over at the, uh, I can't think of it now, right down the street here, um, the old Man Yeti place. Community action. Mm -hmm. Community action. Community action. Uh, we do a lot of work with community action, especially when it comes to fuel is a big one that a lot of our veterans need. So it's a lot of community action stuff. Um, and then we have a lot of nonprofits that we, we can use or we send them to them. Uh, we've been pretty lucky lately with, uh, it's um, based out of Boston. It's, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, Volunteers of America. They've helped with um, some financial issues for some of our veterans that we can't help them with. And the VA doesn't have access to help them with or, or local charities don't have. So they've, they've been pretty good for us. Uh, but in our other outreaches, we have the VFWs, the DAV, um, the American legions, we reach out to them a lot. They have a lot of different programs that they take in money specifically to help veterans. So, and they're always looking to help veterans because a lot of veterans won't come looking for the help to them. So we send them right. to those organizations. Right. What, what um, percentage of your veterans right now are Vietnam veterans? Well, I, I couldn't even give you an idea on that, ma'am. No idea. No okay. idea. But uh, I can tell you there right now, they're probably our most um, seen and used veterans that we have, especially with Agent Orange. Um, and 
one of the big things about um, those veterans is, unfortunately, they're dying from the Agent Orange. Yep. A lot of them did not receive VA benefits for the diseases they caught with Agent Orange. So we're doing that paperwork after the fact. So their wives end up getting what they call dependent indemnity compensation right. because a lot of those wives came from single home working um, families, only the husband worked and, and the wife didn't. So they're trying to live off that husband's social security, mm -hmm. which would automatically put them on chapter 115. We give them that DIC, that puts them off the 115 and making more money. So it actually saves the town money by us not putting on one chapter 115 and the federal government's paying the bill instead. Thank you. You're welcome. Ma And you said that 45, 44% of the salaries are paid by the 55 Correct. other yep. is that by Is that percentage determined by population of the participants? But, or the yep, it, it's a little of both. So it's, it's depending on, um, we base it off 50% off the population and 50% off the EQV of that town. Yeah. Um, like, value. Like basically the what the value of the town is tax wise. Okay. Um, so that's how we break it down for, for all the towns. So it, and there's a hiking loop for you to look at it. it. This is the sheet that we use that we send <laughs> to all you. the towns. Um, is, is, you know, when Tim tried to explain it to me, I was like, what? So um, it took a little while to there's get that through my head. Um, okay. Yeah. So in reality, when you break it down for this year, that's the total amount that we're sending out to all the towns. Mm -hmm. And this is what the towns are going to reim reimburse us. Okay, so so we're paying forty four percent. This number is large. No, nope, we're paying we're paying fifty six percent. So uh -huh. Greenfield's that much, and that's how much the districts are paying back. Got it. Okay. And that's the total that's of total. what we kick out to them. So it's payroll. Um, we kick out payroll to them, incurred costs, um, office maintenance, rent, okay. printing, and various paper products. And of course, our mileage in conference seminars and reimbursements. Okay. So the only thing that really doesn't go back to them is our chapter 115 costs. Okay. They have their own chapter 115 costs. Yeah. So we send them an estimate that they should, each town okay. should estimate okay. for chapter 115. So this is, I'm trying to. R right. Look at yeah. These, so how the these initial numbers cost these of numbers. everything combined, yeah. that's what our total cost okay. is. And then so we we're being reimbursed 56%. Uh, Forty-four percent of certain costs. So pretty much every cost except for here mm -hmm. is reimbursed by the town. Okay. Can you just? I, I'm not sure if I'm getting the number right. Yep. Forty-four percent was paid for by the other towns, or forty-four. Yeah, okay. Towns. Yep. Right. Greenfield contract we does fifty-six percent. Fifty-six percent. And I will tell you probably. I don't know, 80%, 75% eh, of our business are Greenfield residents because we're here. Yeah. They come right to us. So, um, you know, we go out and do outreach to the other towns, hoping they come to us. But usually we don't hear from the other towns, except for Montague, unless it's an emergency with a veteran. Huh. Then we're behind the eight ball. And thank you for your service. Yes. yes thank you. you very much. And thank you for waiting so quick. Sure. No I actually have one more question. Sure. So last year's, starting with this, the veteran benefits, starting with this 5771. Yep, yep. Okay. So that was about 260000 last year. Yep. And we appropriated for that. Yep. And then the state reimbursed us for 75% of that. Next year, we'll, each quarter, we'll get 75% of each quarter we pay. Yeah. It's on the charity sheet. Oh, we actually use in costs. We may not, we not may use all that by the end of the year. So there may be some. There's usually with Chapter 115, because it's an estimate, we don't want to go under and have to come back and take for more money. We usually go a little over. No, no, it's okay. So what, uh, that's my, my point was we appropriated for, yeah. say, would even say, look, let's say, in 21, say that we appropriated for $220,000. We appropriated or taxed for. And then the city received, just say as a, an estimate, 160000 Is that correct? From, from where? From the state? Yes. Okay. So then the next year, yep. we would have appropriated for the same amount 
not subtracting anything. We get back what we pay out. So 75 cents to the dollar that we pay out on chapter 150. So say if it's $100,000 we paid out, we get $75,000 next year. But you didn't decrease that in the following year. See what I mean? Yeah. Kind of. okay, go ahead. Go, go, Chris. Did you understand that, what so, my questioning? Yes, I do. Um, I, the um, If you're talking about what we... Uh, Appro what we appropriate on an annual basis, yep. I believe is, is based on what the department itself forecasts its need is going to be. Right. Okay. And then they submit on a quarterly basis for reimbursements. They come in on, on, uh, on, for, on uh, the cherry sheet is where they come in. And your question is, how does that offset the appropriation? It, yes. It, well, the, the, uh, it's the same thing as, um, geez, I'm sorry, it's getting late. The town upfronts the money based on an estimation of what they think their clients are going to be or their needs are going to be. And then they submit the bill to Boston and Boston reimburses 75%. So it goes into cherry sheet, goes into general fund. I thought, that's what I thought. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Got it. Okay, that, I, I got it. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. It was good to meet you. You too. I, well, I met you, I actually met yeah. you. Yeah. I just thought, all right, anything else? I'll just thank you for the work that you do and for hanging out with us. Oh, <laughs> You've never had to go to a division meeting. Right. <laughs> All right. This is not Do we have any other business? Is there any other business? Thank you so much. Anything else? Any other business? Okay. So our next meeting is going to be April 27th at um, Thursday at 6 o'clock here. And we'll do, be doing GSET and Enterprise and Public Safety. And that's it. I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. 4G. Second. All right. So we're adjourned at 922.